purpose this morning is to try to make you undisturbable. What could we do that would give it that energy and enthusiasm so that the work wouldn't rock you, so that the problems wouldn't get in the way, so that you could be undisturbable in the face of the challenges that we deal with every day? For me, the people that are most undisturbable are children, aren't they? Children are, no matter what, they're just, they're enthusiastic, energetic, creative, they just, no problems ever get in their way. And to me, in the beginning, I used to believe that my topic was adding passion to purpose. And I printed it on everything. Boy, I had the logos designed. It was so exciting. And you get excited when you print it on everything. And then you realize that's a stupid idea. <laughs> and I printed it on everything. Because <laughs> the truth is, passion is never something we add on. It's something that's always there. We just forget. We all had it. We had it particularly when we were children. One of the authors that I like recently, I don't know if any of you have read this or not. But his name is Juan Miguel Ruiz. Juan Miguel Ruiz wrote The Four Agreements. And have you read? Ah, a few of you in the audience. If you have not read it, it's a wonderful book. It's based on a 2,000-year-old Toltec philosophy passed down generation to generation in southern Mexico by what they call Nagwals. And the essence of the book is that we are who we are at our best when we are children. And then after that, we become domesticated. Ooh. And we lose that very best part of ourselves. You know, children, children, nothing seems to get in their way. Little kids can throw up and it's like, Bleh! can I go play? <laughs> Don't they? They just let go and they move on. And yet adults, if we just see that, we think, oh, I I'm going to need some time off. <laughs> Ooh, that, that was not, I mean, the, out the nose and all. Oh. I'm filling out the slip right now because really everybody knows that's not a good thing. <laughs> and if we're the ones that have sort of <laughs> some kind of ailment, we, we want to tell everybody about it. It's like, did, 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 you, did, you not, did you know I threw up? <laughs> I, 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 it was last week. I, I, just did, I just didn't know if I got to you yet. <laughs> we, want to, we want to tell everybody about it, don't we? We want to hold on to the past. We want to worry about the future and because of that, we spend a little time now in the present. I think laughter brings us into the moment, and isn't that what we want? We want to share that moment, that time. Some people, some people just never seem to grow out of that. Some people are in the present, in the moment now. Now, what is this a picture of here in Boise? Yes, the grove, it's that fountain that all the little children play in. He seems to be a reasonably large child. <laughs> This so is my friend Bill Ferret, 60 years old. We're downtown on a Saturday morning. The children are playing there. I said, Bill, you want to run through that fountain? And he said, get your camera. <laughs> <laughs> he came out the other side and he said, you know, I didn't think I'd get quite that wet. <laughs> <laughs> he sort of had this image of himself darting in and out of the raindrops. Look at that, hey. <laughs> they came out, whoosh, gosh, that was chilly. <laughs> but Bill's ability to play is astounding. He runs the Boulder Dam Credit Union, Boulder City, Nevada. He pulled up behind the credit union in his parking spot where he parked his car there. He calls his car the chick magnet. It's an old station wagon. <laughs> he got out of the car, headed into the credit union, used his keys, turned on the alarm, headed into the back of the credit union. All of a sudden, whoop, 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 the alarm goes off. What the heck? Heads back out to his car, uses his keys, turns the alarm off. Heads back into the credit union. Boop, boop, boop. Alarms goes off again. Dang it. Heads back out of the car. Click. Turns it off. Heads back into the credit union. Boop, boop, boop. Heads back out of the car. Dang it. Turn it off again. He hears giggling on the roof. <laughs> His assistant manager, Eric, is on the roof with a spare set of keys. Ha <laughs> ha! That's really fun. They create an environment where that is not only acceptable, it's absolutely necessary to survive. Eventually, Eric built up enough nasty joke points that they were going to get him back. So they went downtown Boulder City, Nevada. They borrowed a mannequin. They took the mannequin out, dressed him up, and Eric has his own parking spot as well, unfortunately for him. <laughs> because they went out to his car, took the mannequin, and they stuffed the mannequin underneath the front wheels of Eric's car. <laughs> You're thinking you don't need friends like this, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Then the police station is right next door to the credit union, fortunately for them, and they went and got the wonderful yellow tape and strung the yellow tape out around the car. 
It's that attention to detail that makes the difference. <laughs> then they, they got a uniformed officer and a plainclothes officer to help them. And they stood right outside the front door. At that point, the entire staff of the credit union's in on this little story. And one walks by the window and they look out. They said, Eric, what's going on with your car? <gasps> Who's messing with my car? And he runs over to the front door. As he heads out the front door, the uniformed officer places one hand on his pistol and the other hand in Eric's chest. Excuse me, sir, is that your car? He looks over and sees the legs sticking out from underneath the car. <laughs> he runs over to the car. Ah! By then, the entire credit union is standing outside saying, payback's hell, isn't it? <laughs> uh, but how powerful is that in creating the environment? They have books and books and books of stories like this because they make play a priority. Do you think that makes them less effective as an organization or more effective? Yes, they have never ever lost an employee to competition because everybody wants to be part of that team. They create an environment where it's fun to work. And that's what this is about. Work can be, should be, ought to be fun. We're always more effective at everything we do, whether it's being a parent, being a spouse, or being employed.
aren't they? Little kids from dawn until dusk, they want to do one thing, they want to have fun, don't they? Think about it. What is the worst time of day for a young child? It's when they have to go to... Now imagine that for you as adults. <laughs> I got to go to bed. <laughs> Yeah, for us, it's like my favorite piece of furniture. I love my bed. I want to bring it with me. <laughs> Don't we? I mean, little kids are so focused on having fun. When I mean, little kids think about it, little kids can throw up. And it's like, Bleh! can I go play? <laughs> and, and adults are like, D -d 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 did you know I threw up? It, it was last week. <laughs> we just like to hang on to that stuff, don't we? Little kids, we, we each have in us what's called a reticular activating system. And it's a filter that's designed to filter out information that's considered to be unimportant. It's like in your car. You know, you can set the radio dial on you know, whatever channel you want to listen to. Do you ever set it just on an irritating level of static, just in case you're having a good day, you want to irritate yourself? You can push that button. <laughs> oh, God. Ooh, I feel angry now. Yeah, right? I think that'd be a dumb thing to do. And yet at work, we tend to do that, don't we? We tend to look for what's missing in our environment instead of looking for what we want. stage because you ask them for something and they do this. <sighs> it doesn't matter what they say, does it, after that? That's everything. And then those things happen over and over and over again. So they move quickly to DEFCON 2. <laughs> stage 2 is resent. I resent this person. I resent what's going on. I resent the traffic. Whatever it is. Don't we do that? Sure we do. Stage 3 is something we don't usually act out. 
We just sort of imagine it in our own minds, don't we? We think about that car that's tailgating us on the freeway. We think, I wonder what their face would look like pressed on the inside of the windshield, right? Revenge! <laughs> right. Can I put you on hold for a moment, please? Put you on hold for four days. Some of you do this, don't you? Jeez, excuse me, I seem to drop the pink, 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 drop the pink, pink phone, pink, 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 pink. Don't we? Yeah, even if we don't do it, we imagine doing it, don't we? Oh, sure we do. And then after, and that after something, somebody's got a really, so you got a picture going there for you, don't you? I, I know it, we do this. And then after this happens, then we forget about it immediately, don't we? Not bloody likely. Then we just sort of imagine it in our own minds. We go through the little cycle. Na -na 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 and then it's break time. What should we talk about at break time? Na -na 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 right? And then it's honey, I'm home. Na -na 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 and I'm not trying to convince you that these people don't deserve it. They probably do. But who doesn't deserve it? You don't deserve it. Because your mind cannot tell the difference between something vividly imagined. When you're home, you don't have these problems. But when you're staying in a hotel, you just don't know where all of the mirrors are. <laughs> It's gonna be, it's gonna take some therapy, maybe to overcome it. You just, certain, you know, the mirror's angling, you see parts of yourself you just don't, should not see. You know? <laughs> In the morning, it's sort of depressing, it's just, you have to have to have to have to that. But, um, wonderful trip in, I flew into Omaha and drove here, and I, I, I have some good friends from Nebraska, and Nebraska's gotta have the most avid fans. The so I'm wearing the appropriate red shoe. That goes, that ought to work just fine. I didn't realize how exciting uh, Nebraska was until I drove in and I got to see one of the, you know, they, they even named the cities to reflect how exciting Nebraska is. As I drove by, Wahoo! <laughs> of this program, take care of business, and uh, at least I talked back and forth about, you know, what, what do we want to do? What is it that's most appropriate for this group? And I think that, that you spend so much of your lives, you know, taking care of business and taking care of each other, taking care of each other's children, taking some other things that to me I felt the most appropriate topic, topic would be really, you know, taking care, taking care of you. <coughs> taking care of you. You know, what do we do? just to take care of ourselves each and every day. What do we do to feed ourselves? Just like this particular event is all about, what do I do to help improve myself personally, to make myself better, to be able to deal with the challenges that you go through every single day, because there are so many of those things. Now, I thought if you had a location for the Taking Care of You University, I thought a good location for that might even be in Wahoo! <laughs> isn't, isn't that how you want to feel? Exactly. And you're always supporting other people, and I found a picture of those supporting others. I thought, ah, oh, oh. <laughs> And isn't that how we want to be? Isn't that how we want to be for each other, for ourselves? Is to have that kind of support and encouragement. Be able to truly appreciate the things that we do. They say the deepest craving in human nature is the craving to be appreciated. Dr. Biggs said that, you know, it just doesn't work just the you know, cell phones and the faxes and the pagers and all that. You've got to have this personal connection with other people. Maybe these people in the room are some of the only people that, around that truly understand what you do, that understand your challenges and speak your language. It's so important to get together and realize that you're not alone. <laughs> there are others that go through this as well. What do you do to create that? I really know them for two things. One is I'm, I'm known for my red high top tennis shoes. My tennis shoes really represent the fact that I, I believe that we live in a time of unprecedented change and uncertainty. And I believe in order to be effective, we have to bring the spirit and creativity of play 
to everything that we do. I know for me that I'm certainly, I, I'm a much better parent, I'm a much better spouse, I'm much better at everything that I do when I take myself lightly and my job seriously. My focus today is to uh, find a way to go help you to do that, to be able to enjoy that process to go along the way and to be appreciated for each step along the way. It's, it's not getting to the end result, is it? It's that process that we go through and getting there that makes all the difference. And going to Montana, I'll be in Montana next week, and it's interesting. Like It's like coming here, kind of. That you never get to fly directly to where you want to go. <laughs> no, no, there's always that thing. We want to put the airport as far away from anything that you need to go to. <laughs> so, so did you get the experience of driving? <laughs> and uh, as you go there, one of the things that you do, and I know you do it here, we do it really all around our, our part of the country. I was in Chicago yesterday, and, and just not the same, although being in Chicago on April Fool's Day was sort of, sort of fun. <laughs> it's, you get, get to be able to mess with people. You know, on April Fool's Day, you can get away with doing things that you wouldn't do otherwise. And so for me, it's, it's a lot of fun because you can stand in the airport. Because in the airport, everybody listens to everybody else's cell phone call. Have you noticed that? <laughs> everybody. And if the plane is late, you know, then, then, you know, everybody's got to get on the phone and tell them about their crisis. Oh, you know, like, I can't believe. <laughs> yeah, right. Every plane is late. <laughs> you can't believe. You know, are you kidding me? So I thought you could have a lot of fun on, on your cell phone. As you just, just get on your cell phone, just talk to yourself and say, you're kidding me. How, 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 did, how did a snake get on the plane? <laughs> <laughs> and if you didn't have a cell phone, you can always do this. You can always press your right ear and say, Male Caucasian. <laughs> Blue jacket, black pants. You know, it's like just loud enough that the person can hear you. And they're like, what the? <laughs> you have to have a sex sense of humor to do these things, but it's fun. <laughs> I was with a pharmacy group in Anchorage, Alaska just recently. Can you imagine all the fun that they can have on a cell phone? <laughs> well, how many did he take? <laughs> well, you're not supposed well, well, of course he can hang his clothes on it. I just thought that's not <laughs> Person. 
I, I know that good to great, great has been part of the theme here, and there's so many wonderful books. To me, one of them is is uh, is the book that talks about the difference in sub-Saharan African tribes. Peter Senge talks about the fact that they use the term Ubuntu. And first off, they they would never consider passing another person without that kind of greeting, because they believe first off that people are people because of people. So they always give them that kind of greeting. And that greeting for them, Ubuntu just means they, they look for other people and say, greeting, I, I look for the best in you. And isn't that really what this event is about? You know, what do we do for the look for the best set in each other and in everything? Because there's so many parts of the country, I tell you, being in Chicago yesterday, they, they wave at you with one finger too, don't yeah. they? <laughs> <laughs> and they can't have two hands on the wheel because they got the one finger up and the other hand is on the horn. <laughs> yeah, it's scary out there. There are so many unhappy people. I believe that for us, I shared that short story with the Northwest Regional Primary Care Association. And afterwards, I got a letter back and the gentleman said, I just opened a brand new clinic. And I, and I think education is difficult. It is. It's hard. But healthcare, healthcare is so hard. It's just so broken in so many different ways. And he was in a rural clinic, you know, and healthcare in metropolitan areas is difficult. But especially when you get in rural areas, it's so hard because they don't have enough people, enough staff. They're trying to service the people that, that don't have the income. He says, I had to find some way to create a focus. And he sent me this little button, that little line drawing, that simple recognition to say, this is what we're about for each other. You know, many of you have maybe seen the, the story about Seattle. I grew up in Seattle, Washington, but the story about the, the little fish market and the story that created from that called Fish. Remember that? <laughs> Which, growing up there, was such a fun place to, to be and to experience because of the way they are. And not only do they, one of the things they show you in the story is that if you order a salmon, there's a salmon's coming! Woo! You know, I throw that salmon. But the other thing, everybody else in the fish market will say that same thing at the exact same time. Because it's a recognition that when one person says, oh, we're, we're here, then it's everybody else participates as well. My favorite part of the fish market, though, is the monkfish. Have you ever seen a monkfish? They are ugly. <laughs> they are so, they got a big, huge mouth. And so they have, of course, the fish out on the, on the ice, and it's laid out there, and there's this monkfish that's laying down, and they use a stick to prop its mouth open. It's big, ugly fish, and they've got a little sign next to it that says, Hi, I'm a monkfish. <laughs> and of course, everybody, you know, because if you haven't seen one of those before, you know, you just always, oh, I've got to go see this, you know. And of course, you can't see it from a distance. <laughs> no, you got to get right up close to see this monkfish. And so people get right up close to see the monkfish, and what you don't see is they have a rope tied around the tail of the monkfish that goes up over the ice and attaches to a post behind where the fish are. And so as soon as somebody gets close to it, somebody reaches over and they go peek on that rope, and the monkfish jumps and people are like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> So if you go there, you have to watch the monkfish. <laughs> it's great entertainment. But, but it's really what it's about. It's about creating a focus. You know, it, it doesn't have to happen all the time. Like for me, I'm telling the story with you now about the monkfish. But that happened years and years ago. But as soon as I begin to tell the story, it's happened again. <coughs> it's happened again for me because once again, then I've created that focus. You know, what is it that we do to create that focus for ourselves and for each other? In Tibet, their greeting is Tashi Dele. And they, they put their hands like this, and their greeting is Tashi Dele. And that greeting says that I honor the greatness in you. And that's really what today is about. It's about honoring the greatness in yourself and honoring the greatness in each other, truly appreciating what you do. When I was on the plane, I, I flew Frontier to Chicago. And one of the things Frontier has done now is they have... Uh, television, instead of movies, you can pay five dollars and you can watch TV on this little tiny screen that's right in front of you. And I don't know where the TV shows are from, but the person that was sitting in front of me was watching this old TV show. I thought, well, I haven't seen that forever. And, and, and I, th I truly believe, I believe that every single thing that happens in our lives happens to teach us something. If you're willing to pay attention and look at what that lesson is. Like for me, one of the lessons since being here, how many of you are staying here in the hotel? But you, 
How many times have you closed your luggage and zipped it up and said, okay, I'm neat and tidy now, and you've zipped up your luggage, put it away to realize, dang it, I've got to get something else out of my luggage. I can't tell you how many times I have done that. I tell myself, now don't zip up the luggage because you're going to need something out of it. Well, to me, the symbolism or the lesson there is the same thing is true with life. So often we get to think, oh, I know this. I know the answer. I've got, I have every solution. I'm an academic, you realize. Yes. Therefore, I'm incredibly intelligent, and I have all of the answers that you would need if you just asked me about them. Correct? <laughs> don't feel like you've got all the answers? Yes, I've been a parent for some years now, and as long as I don't have another child, I'll know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> if I do have another child, I realize I'm clueless once again. And so we zip up our mental luggage, don't we? And we put it away. Yes, I've got all the answers. Only to realize sooner or later, you've got to get your luggage back out, open it up, and look for something else. Man, it's just lessons everywhere. Mm. The other lesson for me is so true. And these are all true. I'm just, I'm telling you true stories. <laughs> <laughs> They're meaningful. <laughs> to me, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I got all this little package of almonds when I got here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> At least it gave them to me so that when I would come to talk to her, I'd have all that stuff in my teeth. <laughs> <coughs> that would give me, you know, the, the lesson is humility. Look at that stuff in your teeth. <laughs> there you've got all the, the true story. So I'm, you know, much away on my almonds, get all over my face and everything. And I dropped one. And the carpets are like this in the room. It's exactly the same color as the nomen. It is. It is. <laughs> You're all wondering, where is this story going? <laughs> 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 this <laughs> to leave that thing that I dropped for, and, and for purposes of metaphor, it's like when you make a mistake and you do something and it's like, oh, I'm just going to leave this. I have stepped on that stupid <laughs> <laughs> for 700 times. I am. Every time I, in one place in the room you would never go and I, every time I walk over, ow, dang it. I'm in thing anyhow. Everything happens. Everything happens to teach us a lesson. And I truly believe that if we don't learn those lessons the first time around, the next time the lessons come back, the tuition goes up. I believe Frost says to look around and learn every lesson as possible, all the things that happen. And thinking about appreciation, I don't know if you had a chance. I was uh, in Anchorage near the time of the Iditarod. And so I got really interested here about what went on. And, and actually, I have not seen this person speak. She speaks a number of times. She finished the Iditarod 11 or six different times, 1,100 miles. Think about that. It takes 11 days, 23 hours, 53 minutes to do the Iditarod. And she was talking about what it took to be able to do that and to be able to hate, you know, get the, the dog to be able to go that far. It's just, you know, that the dogs can go without, they can go without food. They can go out without water for a period of time. It's amazing how much they can go without sleep. But she said, you know, the one thing the dogs can't go without is praise. Those dogs constantly need that praise. Come on, we can do it. Here we go. Wow, this is so wonderful. Well, this year, there was a, a young lady from Bend, Oregon, that competed in Iditarod. And what was special about her? She's blind. She's blind. Think about it. And she's been trying. I, didn't, I haven't read the whole story, but I'm going to. And I wish soon I will download the picture because I have to have it because I thought at the time. I thought, what a wonderful message. She's been trying to do the Iditarod for a number of years, and they won't let her. They say, oh, this is not possible. You can't do this. You just, you know, no way. We're going to let you into it. And so finally she was able to, to get into the Iditarod. Her dad maxed out all of his credit cards in order to give her the chance to be able to do this you know, lifetime dream. She trained all the dogs for it to go and drive all the way up there for the whole event. And you think, you know, if it takes, if it takes you know, 1,100 miles to be able to do this, she was maybe at, you know, 1,000 miles. Because the night before the, the night, the night before the end of the race, what happened? Some of her dogs got sick. Some of her dogs got sick. 
And after it being a, a lifetime dream, you know, family putting everything they could possibly into it, her training everything they could do, but in that close to the finish line, she says, no, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. I need to quit now. And the night before the end of the race, she did. But what was fascinating to me was her sense of perspective about the whole thing. You know, people interviewed her. I don't know if you saw this, but they interviewed her to you know, talk about what it would take in order to accomplish something so amazing in your life. And they said, you, you've got to overcome so many obstacles. And they, they looked at her. And if you've seen her picture, you'll appreciate this. They asked her, said, tell me, what, what is one of the most, what, what's the most difficult obstacle you've had to overcome? She looked at the interviewer and she said, being blonde. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what a wonderful perspective? See, she's not going to take all those things too seriously. No, it's not about that. No, it's about maintaining your perspective, about putting things the way they need to be. I believe that we have to feel and believe that what we do is, is truly heroic. Time is supremely meaningful. The crisis, that you can't really see this, so I'll read it for you. The crisis in modern society is that people no longer feel heroic. Is what you do very heroic? And if you don't, all you've got to do is, is talk to the parents of the children that you're there to help set the example for. It is so heroic, and it's so critically important what we do. But do you remember that each day when you wake up in the morning and say, Dum -da -dum, I'm feeling heroic today. <laughs> no. We just forget. You know that old-fashioned TV show I, told, I saw on the plane? It reminded me of one of the cartoons. This will show you how old I am. That I remember from my childhood. And that was underdogs. <laughs> Remember underdogs? Yes. And that's the way you are, I'm sure, as well. You know, when you look around at your, your friends or whoever that there, when Polly's in trouble, I am not slow. It's hip, 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 and away I go. <laughs> you got to do that in your office, I dare you. <laughs> Some people, you shouldn't bring this up to you. You're going to do this, aren't you? <laughs> uh, yeah, somebody's got to have a picture of it. <laughs> don't, we, don't we wish for all four heroes in our life? People that are going to take care of us. I think we do. We want to find those people. I've been lucky in that I've had some heroes in my life. This is one of them. This is my dermatologist. His name is Dr. Randall Bird. And when you look at his face, don't you look... Guy is a nice man, isn't he? You can just tell look at him. It's just like a great guy. Well, before I had a chance to meet Dr. Burr, this was about five years ago now, I had gone in for a physical. And my mom and dad had been visiting, and my wife says, You get in. You do whatever your wife says, by the way. <laughs> get your physical. Okay, all right. And she says, And you should have him check out that mole. I don't like that mole. I said, oh, Okay, I'll go in. So I did. And I had my physical, and he looked at the mole, and he says, oh, no big deal, it's a blue knee, but cut that dude right off of there, no problem. So, that was on a Wednesday. And Friday afternoon, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I got a phone call from my doctor. And I knew I was going to get my lecture, you know, you're getting fat, <laughs> you got to stop beating that stuff, you better run some more, and you have a malignant melanoma. I don't think that's a very good thing. He said, I'm sorry to tell you this on a Friday afternoon, but I thought you should know as soon as possible. And you have an appointment on Tuesday morning with Dr. Randall Burr. He's the best dermatologist in the entire state. Now, you know, first off, I didn't know anything about melanoma. You know, I didn't know anything about that. Now, this is your sunblock talk. I, mine got that way in about one month. I was going to put off my appointment because I wanted to get disability insurance. And when you're self-insured like I am, it is incredibly expensive. Mine was one millimeter thick. At three millimeters thick, your chances of survival are 50%. So I didn't know anything about it. So after the phone call, and I went and looked it up on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so by Tuesday morning, how do I feel? I am tweaked, absolutely. But I'm not showing it, right? No, everything's fine, huh? That's good. And we met Dr. Burr for the first time. 
the first thing he did that was so amazing to me is realize that it's always harder on the other person. Always. Not the person that it's happening to, it's always harder on the other people that don't have any control. For the first thing he did, he never looked at me one time. He looked at my wife the whole time. Next thing he did that was so powerful was he realized that when people are stressed out, do they pay attention? No. 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 So he knew we weren't listening very well, so he said, well, can I draw a picture on you? <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> Draw a little funny face or something, I don't know. And then he wanted to relax me. And I realized, first off, this is the very first time that I've met him. This is something that is reasonably serious. And so he looks at me and said, you don't mind a nickname, don't you? I said, well, no. He said, Benny Hanna. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And then he had to inspect the rest of me to make sure that I didn't have you know, any, any place else on me, which wouldn't have been so bad except he's a teaching doctor. <laughs> so it's him, a young female doctor, a really young female intern, could have been my daughter. Just drop your pants down around your ankles. Shrinkage. <laughs> <laughs> he said, turn around really slow. I said, it's actually fairly difficult to turn around fast with your pants. Like this. <laughs> but then he said that one thing that made all the difference. He said that I am I'm so busy here that if you have questions, I don't have time to give you my full attention. So please, if you have questions, please call me at oh, I've never experienced anything like that before. You know, usually your doctors are so busy, you know, they don't have time to pay attention to you in the office, much less to call them at home. And I'm intimidated too. And you know, it's like, I'm not gonna call this, you know, this whole guy in the whole state. No way. But he wants that relationship with me. So what does he do to me? He calls me. He calls me three times at home. I can hear his kids in the background. The last time he called me was on Saturday before I went into surgery. Now keep in mind, he's not even doing the surgery. There's a nuclear physician going to do the surgery. He calls up and talks to my wife. He says, "Hi, oh, my friends, the Morgans. This is Randall." Patty's like, "Randall." <laughs> started talking about how I was feeling about some other things he had carved off me. No, he said, no, time off. Time off. How does he feel about emotionally about the surgery on Tuesday? He called up to ask about a surgery he wasn't even going to do. Isn't that amazing to you? So here's my questions to you. First off, did those phone calls, were he, was he required somehow to do that? If you look in the job description within his partnership, you know, here's what you've got to do. You make sure you call all of your patients at home on Saturday morning, even if you're not involved. Do you think it said that in his job description? No. Did his partner say that's a great idea? Does everybody else? In dermatological school, here's what we do. We call everybody. No. In fact, so many others, think, most people in healthcare, do they enjoy being in the profession? No. Exactly right. They say 47% of people in healthcare would not recommend the profession to one of their children. But he decided, no, not about that. It's not, I make my job the way I need my job to be. He found his way to create that. Did his phone calls, did his phone calls, did his phone calls make energy or did they take energy? They made energy because he knew what he needed to do. He knew what he needed to decide to make it the kind of job that he wanted to we create the kind of life that we love to live. Because it's, it's not up to you. You may have a great boss. You might not. You might have a wonderful, absolutely perfect spouse. You might not. You may have perfect children. 
That will go away. <laughs> But is it up to any of them? No. Who decided for him? Who decides for you? You're the only one that can decide. You have to decide for yourself. What is it going to take? I think, his, as I mentioned already, I, I truly believe, and I, now I'm becoming much more aware of it, that if I look around, if I pay attention, there is always a message that is made just for me. When I was in Anchorage, you know, every single hotel now, they all have these little plaques or placards or signs that are in the bathrooms or somewhere in the hotel room that talk about the impact of all the, the laundering and the impact it has on the environment. You know? That says we wash so much every day and, and you have this opportunity then, if you choose to hang your, your towel, for example, up over the shower rod, then they won't launder that every day. We don't typically do that at home. And so I've seen them so many times, and just, you know, like you, once you've seen it, it's like, okay, I've, I've already seen that before, no need to look at it. But sitting on the counter was that same little plaque, but somehow it was just a little bit different in that the line in bold, right in the very center of that, said, you decide for yourself. Oh. That's a good message. That is such a good message. Just like for me, you know, I've always thought, I've had five ideas to me that my red tennis shoes have represented over time. But you know, it's interesting to me, it's like, you know, I, they, they have those five ideas and then I put them in the suitcase, right? And I zip the suitcase up. But to me, over time, I realized, you know, it's always being a work in progress. It's going from being good to being great. And that only happens if we're willing to, to open our mind up to the other possibilities. And to me, one of the things my red tennis shoes represent to me right now is that you have to decide to choose your own shoes. You've got to decide what that is because those are the things that, that you are passionate about. And there's only a few of those things for us in our lives because life is going to be stressful. They say for us is that if you have one year of high stress, It'll take three years off of your life. If you don't find an outlet for your passion, it'll take six more years off of your life. If you live in constant turmoil and conflict, it'll take another eight years off of your life. <laughs> Some people feel like a big one is coming off! Oh, yeah. All those external stresses, I believe you, you can't get rid of those. Our life is just full of a lot of external stresses. I think all we can do to counterbalance that is add the internal new stresses, the positives for each of us. Decide what we are passionate about in our lives, what will make the difference. <laughs> <laughs> Stanley Kubrick said, the reality of a thing is not the think of a thing. The reality of a thing is the feel of a thing. <laughs> it may make sense that this rock has been there for thousands and thousands of years, but how many of you would be willing to walk out on it and have your picture taken? Today, today is really about the feel of a thing. How do we feel about our life, about our jobs, about our coworkers, about each other? Max Dupree wrote this book called Leadership is an Art. It goes a tribal storytelling. Everything that I do is based on a story because really since the dawn of time, that's how we learn best. We always learn best that way because it creates a lattice by which we choose to remember things. So each day, as I, as I share some of the stories with you today, first off, I don't give you handouts. I don't give you handouts right away because first off, people get the handouts and they go, oh, I've got the handouts. Right? And I can, and I take the handouts, and when we get done with the meeting, we take the handouts and put the handouts in the drawer. That's a good spot in the drawer. And then if the drawer gets full, then we empty the drawer because we have a place then for more handouts. Because <laughs> it's not about my stories. It's about the stories you think about for yourself, the ideas that you have that you might apply. That's what makes the biggest difference. As I go through these slides, some of you taking notes, I appreciate that. But don't worry about that for now. I will give you everything when we're all done. If you'll email me, 
that I'll send you copies of everything to you. Have all the notes and all the books. And I think there's some wonderful tools that are in there. And I'll also give you some insights into which ones I think that are best. If you choose not to email me, then it wasn't important enough to you, and it would be just like your drawer anyway. So it's choose. It's up to you to decide what's important. We always know this. You're in the business. Education is the key. And knowledge is. This, this half of the room is wondering, what is it? I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> this table up here is picking up. This table needs more caffeine. Because <laughs> I wish I was sitting there. They're right <laughs> <laughs> so, Knowledge is. Uh, knowledge is. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, you're waiting. Yeah. Patience. Thank you very much. Listen, I know he's going to do this thing. He's just like that. It's only knowledge that we first that we remember. That we remember is right, isn't it? And especially after we're 40. <coughs> so, we're 40. <laughs> so part of my challenge for this event is to try to do everything I can in such a way that it will be as memorable as it can possibly be for you. They say we forget 40% of what we hear within half an hour, 50% a day, 70% in five days, and 90% in a week. Yikes. My challenge is to try to make it memorable. Your challenge is to use it. If you don't use it, it is of no value. I like that country song that says, love is not what we're in, it's what we do. It's what we do. It's the actions that we take every day. That's what matters. And if we're not doing the right things, we've got to put in more good stuff until the right stuff chooses to come out. And yeah, I believe, I'm going to start by having big goals. You know, for those of you that are my age, you know, we didn't get, we didn't get a lot of bicycles, did we? We didn't, like little kids, now they get a little bike, and a little bigger bike, and a little bigger bike. We didn't get that, did we? We got one huge, huge, giant-sized bicycle. That's this huge, and you've got to be highly motivated to ride that bike, because it's got a bar right there. If you fall off of that, you might never have children. <laughs> get on my bike, we had a rock in the front yard. So to get on your bike, you had to stand on the rock. It's like, okay, all right, hey, we can do this. Here we go. <laughs> that makes you make that work, right? So it's not so hard to get on the bike. But what did you have to do to get off the bike? Oh. Oh. <laughs> exactly, because I got two little brothers, so you know, bicycles things needed to last back then. And that bike is probably still around, because remember, those things weighed like a million pounds. <laughs> And don't you wish you had it now? Yeah. Because those bikes are so popular now, that would be worth like a jillion dollars. <laughs> so, so we set up here. What you want to do is you want to get close to the rock so you can get off, right? So you're at. Oh, I made it! Right? So you wanted to get close enough to the rock so you could put your foot on it. But what didn't you want to do? Fall the other way. Exactly. Fall the other way or hit the rock. Exactly. And so then you tell yourself, don't. Hit the rock, and then what would you do? Hit the rock. <laughs> <laughs> right into the rock. Exactly. It's like, it's like with your children. You tell those children, don't spill that milk. Yeah. <laughs> what is about to happen next? <laughs> and the child ought to say, Mom, you did it again. <laughs> right? Because you did it. You did it. What is the, what is the worst thing that you could tell someone with a sharp knife? No, <laughs> 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 I want one. <laughs> Why did you say that? Exactly. You just don't. You don't, you don't want anybody because our, our brain, our brain. You know, we think our brain does not work in words. Words come way down the road, don't they? Brain works in pictures. Whatever picture you create, you move in the direction of whatever that picture is. So my question is for you. What picture is it that you create for yourself? What picture is it that you see in your environment? Second question is, what picture is it that other people see of themselves in your eyes? I mentioned earlier, every time that I talk with Lisa, and every time I've talked, and there's so many of you, you've been so kind to me, that your, your optimism about 
you know, what you believe that can happen today, for me, is like, Whoa, I can do anything. <laughs> right? And don't you want that? Don't you want to be around people? Because there are other people I work with, and they want to nitpick me on everything, and I'm like, I don't think I can do it. <laughs> Maybe not. I think I'll go home. <laughs> right? Because they want, and you mentioned earlier that, you know, it's just standing alongside, being next to somebody, and saying, can we do this together? To believe enough in those possibilities. And think about it, now we've got, well, they just have this, this private rocket that, that they have, that they're not going to start taking spaceship rides into outer space. Oh, yes. And that's now going to become part of what, what organization is going to provide you the opportunity for $200,000 to take an hour, you have the $200,000, just say it to go into outer space. Who's going to do that? Virgin Airlines, which was started by who? Richard Branson, exactly. Now, Richard Branson, let's think about this because we're in education. Richard Branson, did he graduate from high school? No. no. Is Richard Branson dyslexic? Yes. Did Richard Branson start off with any money at all? No. But he built every, he built Virgin Records, Virgin Airlines. Now he's the person that that is going to create these opportunities for us to ride up into space. And if you read his book, it says that I look for the best in every one and in everything. How fantastic. In recent Time magazine, he said something. I, I wish I would have written it down, but I like what he said at the time. He says, I find it's just so much more exciting. I learn so much more by saying yes than by saying no. Ah, what do we do? It creates that, that picture, that possibility. Because you think, if you didn't know how to ride a bicycle battle, you know, would we have the audacity to, what we're going to do is we're going to put you on something that just has two wheels. Now, we realize you've never been on two wheels before, but we're going to do this. And it's going to be nine feet taller than you are. I mean, how many of you would, how many of you would try that? You'd be like, ah, I'll forget that. No way. They say, most of us, if we had to learn to walk again as adults, we wouldn't. Because we wouldn't be willing to go through the, you know, falling down, the bumping our head, stubbing our toes, all those things. No. You have those giant goals. Because everything else is just relative. And you've got those giant goals. Because, you, you know, sometimes we know you, you've had days where you get home from work and you're just so tired. You just can hardly make it through the door and you finally make it and you get into your chair. It's like, I am going to stay here for the rest of my life. <laughs> I'm not doing anything for anybody, anywhere. Oops, I have zero energy, I will not survive. I don't know for my wife then, all she has to hear is that song. There's a one day sail at the Bon Marche. <laughs> about mom, you know, because she's just had this other, and you know, mom is, mom is sitting in her chair, and you know, she's got her head down, and, having, uh, and the family's together, okay, and so they're talking with him, the gentleman telling the story, and they said, well, we're worried about mom, you know, mom, I just don't know about mom, he goes, yeah, right, watch, looks over at his mom, he says, mom, let's go gambling, <laughs> <laughs> Way. 
by creating that picture. Just by creating that picture. Isn't that, isn't that what Dr. Berger? Yeah, he did. He just found what that was for him. That was that his reminder. That's what he needed in his life in order to generate the energy that he wanted. You know, we can have, and you probably have had, you know, we have time management classes just for you good, just time. Can you manage time? You got 24 hours in every day. You can't manage time. But you can just manage the amount of energy that you put into that time. How do we generate that kind of energy? To me, I believe that you kind of decide off with a huge goal, just aim to astonish. And to me, this is such a simple example, but of how we just do it the wrong way. Now, if we go, I had a wonderful, by the way, the breakfast here, ooh, they got oatmeal I never saw before. <laughs> <laughs> really cool stuff. Yeah. Don't eat them bread muffins, though. <laughs> See, nobody orders the bread muffin. That bread muffin has been around for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> You're good, though. We're using it to balance this table, right? <laughs> A little survey, but if you look in the survey at almost every restaurant that you go to, it'll say things like, Would well, you get your food? <laughs> Was it hot? <laughs> Did you get it on time? <laughs> Just like you're gonna go tell your friends about that. Gosh, you can't believe it. I got the food I ordered. <laughs> <laughs> restaurant. It's a restaurant over on the coast. And their survey says things like this. They make it feel really important to us. A restaurant survey. Do we welcome you or are we glad to see you? Do we help you have a fun time? This is my favorite. Did you make you smile, giggle, or laugh at least once? <laughs> Think about that. It's a, it's a restaurant. This is the same, you know, it's the same restaurant, same kinds of menus. But for them, they realize that getting you the food that you order, getting it the way that you want it, getting it on time, that's the ante. It gets you in the game. It's no fun. It's no fun about that. What's exciting is we can create a little different goal. Now, would it happen all the time? Can they always do that? No, they probably don't always do that. But it's for them. It's the possibility. It's the possibility that it could happen. Because that's what generates the energy to say, not just to do the standard, not just to do what's in the job description, but to do what's impossible. Because you shoot for that. What do we do that creates those goals for us? Because I think there's a risk every time you do. Grateful for your visit. To me, I think the first step... <laughs> <laughs> Look around you for humor. <laughs> you know, it's everywhere if you look. It's so funny to me. <laughs> I don't think this ad works. <laughs> <laughs> its job is, is, has its challenges. And for me, the, the greatest challenges in my job really are the fact that I have to travel to do what I do. And, uh, and I don't know. There may be classes where you teach people to do this. I, I, I haven't seen it recently, but if you've traveled to airports recently, some people, they must be taking classes in, in order to, to have their, their personalities removed. <laughs> don't you? Very serious, moderately serious. Don't, don't kidding. The laughing, the smiling. We took my father-in-law on a trip for Father's Day. And uh, so we're checking in there at the airport. And those of you that have relatives that are hard of hearing, <laughs> you know how, how they are. And so the lady at the counter is asking them all of those security <coughs> questions. You know, do you have any guns, any knives, any weapons of mass destruction? <laughs> and what do, what do deaf people do when they, they can't hear you? <laughs> <laughs> So 
my wife is trying to interpret for her dad. You know, and she realizes, you know, you got you got to look him right in the eye, <coughs> speak slowly. And the lady behind the counter, you know, yells at my wife, he's got to answer for himself. <laughs> <laughs> he can't hear a word you're saying. <laughs> And, that, and the kind of questions, I don't know who made up those questions. You know, like, <laughs> it's like some terrorists could say, oh, you got me now, you asked the super secret question, you know? <laughs> Rumble still skin, okay, there's my guns, okay. You know? <laughs> what? This is silly. So I think you gotta, you gotta find ways to go make the process more enjoyable. And so for those of you that are getting ready to travel back, you can actually get these from the housekeepers because they'll have them here. And you gotta just keep them in your pocket. So that when you get picked, like I always get picked for the random search. Any of you? I, you know, I get picked so often, I think it's the Randy search. You <laughs> <laughs> don't look that bad. And then somebody told, somebody told one of my friends, they said, well, well the shoes you wear, they, they, they must figure those shoes are disposable. <laughs> so that's not very nice. So the one thing you need to bring with you, you got to bring your own latex glove. <laughs> If you get picked for that random search, you can just put your glove on first. <laughs> you don't say a word, you just wait till they look at you, honey. Then you just say, you go first. <laughs> this, I can just see this in the human resource office. <laughs> You're here for your appointment? <laughs> She told me what she would do. She would, uh, you know, somebody would go into the exam room, and she would just send them to the exam room. She'd just say, no, "Go ahead, and take your clothes off, get in the chair." <laughs> she, she'd look back in. They'd be standing for a long time. So I thought, you know, if I had to search the luggage for somebody from the rat in the mouse tub of America. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so you get a big luggage tag with that. And then I thought, it's a lot more fun than keeping it in your luggage. I used to keep it in my luggage. That's not fun. It's a lot more fun to keep it in your pocket. <laughs> because you know, they always make you empty your pockets and you put it in that little tray. <laughs> tray goes through, and then sometimes they try to be helpful and they hand you the tray. And the best part about this is not how he looks. It's that when you move him, he does this. <laughs> Don't do that there. 
I, at one point, sometimes you do find people that have a sense of humor. At one meeting, I was given this little uh, monkey, this little fuzzy monkey. He was the mascot for this credit union. And so I had him inside my bag, and he wasn't all exposed. He was like his arm was just sticking up, so it's a big fuzzy arm. And the security person got it, and he opened it up, and he saw that, and he did a little, he said, you know, if that had moved, you'd have to come find me. <laughs> so much, but for me, I hate snakes. Oh, I, they just give me the heebie-jeebies. I just, oh. So this is for the Arizona Herpetological Association. <laughs> and I added that little phrase that says, leave the gun, play rattle and run. <laughs> <laughs> and this, of course, to go along with that, you need to bring yourself your own rubber snake. <laughs> you just put in your luggage between things. <laughs> Because you know they're going to be touching all your stuff. <laughs> and you know right when they're going to get to it. So then if they do, then give them a little... <laughs> 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 and so, really, yesterday, yesterday was the perfect... It was like a get-out-of-jail-free card day. Because anytime anybody hit managed, it's like, April Fools! <laughs> Yesterday, dang it! But the other day is what you do is just say, "Well, aren't those kids silly?" <laughs> <laughs> you just blame it on the kids. <laughs> it's not that way. But there are serious parts about travel. Nine thirty. Start nine thirty. Want a break? No. Yeah. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the back one. <laughs> begin to tell yourself that you're forgetful, then immediately you are, forget. and I am, dork, I just forget stuff. And so I, I had a meeting in Salt Lake, and the first thing I did is I, I took my jacket off, because I don't like to wear my jacket, because I like to move around, and it makes me hot. But unfortunately, I took my jacket off, and I was sitting in the back of the room. Now, when you're over 40, and just like you should put things where you can see them. <laughs> because you forget that you got them. Don't you? And so I, I, I got all done with the meeting, and I'm all hyper, and I'm having fun. And so I well, go, go to the airport, and I'm all excited about myself. You know, I'm feeling so proud of myself. Yes, here I am at the airport early. I'm so smart. <laughs> and I'm sitting down, writing my program. I think, well, I better check in and look around. Oh, dork! <laughs> Stupid dork! You don't have your jacket! Do you know, you know what's inside my jacket? <laughs> I go ticketless because I'm stupid about that, so I, you know, but my wallet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> I think, oh, this is really bad. I have got to get on this airplane. And so, you know, I'm desperately searching my luggage for anything that I could possibly, you know, pass for ID. And I find my business card. My business card's red. See, it's red, it's not my shoe. <laughs> it could be a corn Oscar, eh? <laughs> right? And then on the back, he's got my picture on it. Oh. So I'm trying to look as innocent as possible. I get up to the counter, and I explain to the person there, I said, yeah, this is what happened. I've already called on the cell phone. I cannot get my driver's license. I said, but look, I got my business card. It's got my picture on it. What do you think? And we did, this is called the Sullivan nod. When you do this, what do you think? <laughs> Any one of these? <laughs> I have my card, take a look. And I did. And didn't, didn't just say no, said no, and like flicked my card at me. I'm like, ah, no way! I gotta have this. So I'm searching, you know, everything I can possibly find out there, you know, what can I have? And I happen to have the program from the event I was at. 
And so I showed him the program, and I said, look, look, that's me in the program. It's got red shoes. <laughs> no, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> you know, I was like a little kid at that point. You know, little kids, they don't hear anything. They just keep trying and trying and trying. <laughs> And so I said, wait, wait, time out. I got my video. It's got my picture on it. That's me right there. No. <laughs> now just think for a moment. Wouldn't it have been a whole lot easier to, for me to make some fake ID than with all of this stuff? <laughs> so I said, give me the manager. Bring him. You know, it's going to get ugly now. <laughs> because problems expand in direct proportion to the amount of time it takes to resolve them, don't they? And if I have a problem with my meal and the server says, well, let, let, let me take care of that, oh, no big deal. But if she says, well, let me get the manager, bring him on. That's <laughs> <laughs> right? It's bigger than, isn't it? Because you're going to tell it to somebody, you don't want to tell it to somebody else, you just want to fix it. So the manager comes out. I have everything laid out on the counter, you know, very nicely. <laughs> yes. I'm trying to get people around me to do this. Come on. <laughs> I'll pay you money. Come on. Here. So, manager comes out, and immediately you could tell why he was the manager. <laughs> as soon as they stop producing, they, they promote them. <laughs>
And what are they gonna do? They're gonna look at, oh yeah, those are his little beat marks for sure, yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah, those are the beat right there. Just bigger. Oh, what's up? Silly, silly. But I wanna contrast that. My purpose of this story is to tell you an example of two different groups of people in exactly the same situation, but how they respond to that situation differently. So now I am back in Boise again. And I have to leave the next day. I have two problems. One, I still don't have my driver's license. Can't get it. Can't get it until you know, next week sometime. Number two, I don't have the companion pass for my wife to fly with me. Because she flies, or I fly enough, she can fly for free. And so I got to the airport that day, and I don't know how it works for you, but it seems to me when things start to go wrong, it just seems like I became a magnet for other challenges. It's, and I truly believe there is a karma about that. You just become sort of snake bitten. Everything is going to go downhill from there. So I arrive at the airport, and it just seems awfully crowded. What's all these people here? Well, apparently, the airspace for the western part of the United States is controlled by you know some computers in L.A. Who decided to put them there? I don't know. <laughs> that seems to be a problem in the first place. But the computers were down, and so not just one flight, but all of those boards that talk about you know, on-time status, every single board said delayed, 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 delayed. Every flight was four hours late. The airport is packed full of people, and are these people in a good mood? No. So you think about all of the people that are working in the airport. Are they having a fun day? No. No, they're just thinking, oh, you know, this is not good. So. You know, I finally, I, I'm there and I get in line, but fortunately that day, I was lucky. Because that day I was flying my favorite airline. And based on my personality thus far, what would you guess my favorite airline is? Southwest. Southwest just rocks. Yes. <laughs> 100%. You know? And typically if you talk to people to feel that way about them, it's because they've experienced not just things going well, but something goes wrong and you have a chance to see what they're like when it goes wrong. For me, it was, I was in Phoenix, and I wanted to buy, you know those great big steel sunshines you can get that you can put on the outside of your house, you know, as a decoration? You know, I thought, oh, I can have like four of those. <laughs> and I asked the lady who was there, I said, could you, you know, wrap these up so I can check them as luggage? And she nodded her head, which should have made me nervous because she nodded her head because she didn't really speak the language. <laughs> It's like my father-in-law. <laughs> so I'm out goofing off, getting ready, and, and then I show up back at the store just in time to pick up my big steel stars to go to the airport. And she hands me my big steel pointy star in a <laughs> plastic bag. <laughs> That's not good. This could be a weapon. Look at those pointy things there. <laughs> So, you know, I rush in, I get to the airport, show up at the Southwest counter, <laughs> big steel stars in a plastic bag. <laughs> the Southwest person doesn't look at me and say, let me guess, uh, Idaho possibly? He <laughs> <laughs> doesn't, doesn't point to all his friends, we got another one over here, look at this guy. <laughs> Dark face. <laughs> you know, other people, they would just point to you. Out, back of the line, you know. He doesn't do that at all. He just has his own pocket knife. He's the only person with a pocket knife in the airport. <laughs> right? And just cuts open a box and wraps up my, you know, awkward, big, steel stars. Wraps them up like we do this every day. You know, he just made it so easy. So I have confidence because I've experienced that before. And so I finally got up to the front of the line at the Boise Airport. Young man was there, and I said, oh, thank God I am flying Southwest today, because otherwise I'd be screwed. <laughs> he looked at me and said, well, well that, that's, that, that's pretty good sucking up, actually. <laughs> so, thank you so much. I was practicing all morning. <laughs> And he went in the back and he got Christian. And I looked at his name tag. Because usually they come out, they, they stand behind that great big counter, don't they? And they put their hands on their hips and they tell you the rules and the regulations and the requirements. 
and they stand just far enough away from you, you can't quite reach them. <laughs> <coughs> and that's why they have those great big counters. Think about it. Yes, why do they have those? Yes, so they can't reach them. But Christian came out, and he's leaned over the counter to me and said, Mr. Morgan, it's your birthday today, isn't it? I said, yes, it is. Ah, thank you very much. Anyway, these two groups of people, they have the same rules, the same regulations, the same requirements. But one person is doing everything he can to make you happy. And the other person is doing everything he can to be right. Now, to be fair, I would be willing to bet you large amounts of money that it was not that first person's fault. I would bet that if I got a chance to talk to his boss, he'd have one of those bosses that would have said, do it the way I told you to do it, you will do it no other way, and thinking will be punished. <laughs> Isn't that true? Aren't there bosses like that? Do you try to fix those people? They're the problem. And they always want you to fix their people. Those about to, they, they, they want a human resource and say, would you fix my employees? <laughs> You're the one that needs the help. <laughs> Don't you wish you could say that? I wish I could say that sometimes. You know, I think so often it's so unfortunate, many human resource people here, I think sometimes because of the way that you're treated, I think instead you should have a ch change the title. Why not? If you're going to be this way, just change the title. That's the human liabilities department. <laughs> I am serious. It is ridiculous. It's just so sad. My brother-in-law, my brother-in-law is uh, an assistant superintendent in Twin Falls, Idaho. Now, as a, as a history teacher and a coach, the man is amazing. I just, I, I realized I must have slept through all of history because I did, don't have any ideas. And, you know, I want to take him with me places. Tell me about this. It's cool. John, you know, I should have paid attention. And he's just, he mesmerizes you because he loves it so much. And as a coach, the man is incredible. But he felt like, I need to do these things and move up to the ranks and do this. And now he's an assistant superintendent, which in many ways I think is wonderful training if you ever want to be a parole officer. <laughs> Am I kidding? Am I kidding? But the other part that's so sad is I've never seen him be so unhappy. Never. I mean, so many comments. He is such a joyful, joyful person. You know, right? One, my wife talks about him. And then, you know, Johnny and Patty, they're the, one, they're the ones that they stayed up and they waited for Santa Claus. I mean, that's just the way he is. And yet now he has felt that he needed to take this path and can't seem to find another way. It's not what he's gifted to do. What he's gifted to do is teach history and coach. I mean, those are truly his gifts. That's what he's passionate about. Yeah, he's felt like he needed to take this other path along the way, which is so, so sad. So, I, I finally, I'm, I'm thrilled now, and we still got to wait for a while for our plane, and so we're out in the concourse area, and I'm paying attention now, because I think, now here's where you find out, you know, what's going to really happen. And I look over about three gates over, not our gate, a couple of gates over. The story will be over soon, I promise. <laughs> They're going like, we should have people, and we had a chance. <laughs> <laughs> I can't go now. It's in the middle of the story, for goodness sakes. You don't want to make it a cliffhanger? <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Okay, no. it's a quarter two. It's a quarter two right now. I realize it's not I'm not listening, I'm not listening. They're doing this. <laughs> if I plug everything up, everything will be okay. <laughs> Longer. If you hold for too long, then when you go to the bathroom, it's going to take forever. Oh, God. <laughs> I, held it for, I, held it, I held it for so long, that won't go. <laughs> Did somebody run the water? <laughs> I think it's just more fun, because that's what I like. This to me, oh, 
Go back one. You know, as you get on an airplane, as you go, now think about this. Look, actually look at the safety deal when you go back home, if you're flying home. Look at the little safety thing, and you'll think, oh, oh, I looked at it again. I already know this. But see, when I see a group of people that are unhappy, I always think that there's a cause. There's somebody that's causing this because that's, that's how things work. And so if you look at this closely, I think you realize that, you know, you might recognize that person. <laughs> and if you look really closely, yep, that's that person right there. <laughs> you thought they had him in custody. No. It's worse. They made it work for the airline. <laughs> Tyrants come in many forms, though, don't they? You know, in all areas, in all kinds of life. Sometimes, uh, sometimes the tyrants might be your parents, aren't they? Don't you have some of you are like, oh no, the parents are always so nice. <laughs> <laughs> parents can really be a challenge. Sometimes they might be bureaucrats that you have to deal with or are dealing with you in one way or another. Sometimes students can be tyrants, aren't they? Other times it could be coworkers, fellow employees. Sometimes teachers. Every time, it just makes you want to do this, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> 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 do 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 about changing, changing stories and how certain people find a way, regardless of how other people choose to see the world, they choose to create the world <coughs> the way they want to see it. To me, I believe that is one of the hardest challenges in life, is to be who you are, who you are meant to be, in a world that is trying so hard to get you to be like everybody else. Each of us is born with certain gifts. And I certainly you know this with your children, but it's with adults we forget the fact that we need to be looking for our gifts and realize that with each gift that we have, that too much is given, much is expected. You have a responsibility, just like for Dr. Bird. What a sad world it would be if he had never discovered his gift and if he had chosen to take the safe, the easy, the comfortable. Because you know there are people that look at what Dr. Bird does and say, well, that's stupid. You're not getting paid to make those phone calls. Do you, do you bill them for that? You know, insurance companies are going, don't you try to bill us for that. <laughs> what sad, miserable lives they have because they haven't realized that we each have a responsibility to get back to the world. And the world shapes us the way we need to be to do that, doesn't it? It really does. This next group of people, to me, are people that, regardless of all the <coughs> peer pressure, and I think it's so sad, you know, the peer pressure that we experience in our schools, at a time when it's so difficult. For me, you, anybody that knew me in my youth would have never ever expected me to do what I do now. I was just not, I was, I, I, I was so shy, incredibly. I ran for one school office, I had the shortest speech in history. <laughs> and did the entire speech speaking to my belly button. <laughs> I just was. I just was a very late bloomer. When I was going to, to high school, I graduated high school at 120 some pounds and decided that my sport would be wrestling. Now, you know, spandex does not look that good. <laughs> <laughs> and I had such a baby face, I got, I got a retainer when I was in junior high, which gave me bad breath and a really cute lisp. <laughs> And when I got to high school, I finally got braces, and actually I went to college. My first year of college, I wore, you know, and now they have all these different kinds of braces, you know, but it was big deal of braces. And I had such a baby face, you know, people look at me, where's your big brother, kid? Shut up. I'll smack you. <laughs> <laughs> and I still do not, um, people say, well, describe me sometimes as a motivational speaker. Reality is, is when I have a chance to listen to a motivational speaker, I sit right up close to the door. Because <laughs> I don't like that. 
I don't, I don't like people to say, oh, I want you to wake up in the morning and pat yourself <coughs> on the head and tell yourself you're great. That's shit, I'll pat you right in the face. <laughs> I don't like that. But, but I do like the science of understanding how we see the world. To me, that's fascinating. <coughs> I was one of the kids that, you know, I didn't get a baseball bat, I got a microscope. Uh, to me, science has always been so interesting to understand how we do what we do and why. And to me, it is so fascinating to understand in this second part of our program that really will go into the physiology of understanding how we see the world, why we see it that way, and what we can do. The first part is really showing you through stories how other people are able to shape their environment. You know, sometimes we see our eyes, we say, well, our eyes are that for recording what goes on around us. So much you'll find that, that we are, our, our brain and our eyes are co-producers of our world. And much of what we see is generated in our little heads, the way we generate what's going on. And for me, at this stage, I'm in the airport again, and I'm looking around, and I'm watching the way other people are viewing what's happening to them. And again, you know, the rural airport is packed, and there's a lot of people that are waiting, and, you know, everybody's sitting in the airport, and they've got that airport face on. <laughs> it's really anxious, you know. They're waiting for an announcement so they can get on their cell phone and find somebody else. <laughs> And so I listened about three gates down, a young gentleman at the gate agent made an announcement. He said, all right, how many of you are flying with me today? Raise your hands. You know, and about three people raised their hand. Oh, do we have to raise our hand? Because I don't want to. Okay, because really, I'm in a bad mood. And instead of getting out of my bad mood, what I would prefer to do is sit here and rehearse why I'm in a bad mood. <laughs> that way I can still tell the story well to other people later on. Which is sad, because if you had a group full of children, and you asked the same thing, what would have happened? Oh, <laughs> Wouldn't they, yeah, cheeks off the seats, hands in the air, and be like, woohoo, all right, here we go. <coughs> They're just ready, because the kids just realize that the past is just a memory. The future is a possibility. All they have is right now. Little kids, but little kids can throw up, it's like, <laughs> Can I go play? <laughs> Don't they? And adults, if we just see that, we think, oh, I I'm going to need some time. <laughs> I'm going to have to fill out the leave form right now. That really out of <laughs> been ill, then we want everybody else to know about it, don't we? We're just like, did, 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 did you know I threw up? It was, it was last week. I just wasn't sure if I got to you yet. I'll, I'll, I'll check you off. You know, you want everybody in the world to know about it. We just want to hang on. So think about this. He's making, he is making the effort and yet the people around him are looking at him like, hey, look, this is not fun. It's not supposed to be fun. If you are having fun, you're probably on some sort of medication. <laughs> but he doesn't quit. That's what's cool. And he looks around at the group waiting for his plane. He says, good, because we're going to sing a song. <laughs> he said, all of you know the song. The song goes like this. Deo. <laughs> But I changed the rest of the song. It goes like this. When the airplane come, I want to go home. <laughs> I didn't get very many people to sing. But don't you admire the fact that he tried? Yeah. But he looked around and he says, I don't care how you choose to shape your reality. I will shape my reality the way I need it to be. I will not give in and be like everybody else. We finally got on our plane. It's packed, and people have been waiting a long time, and <coughs> probably don't smell that good by then. <laughs> and we sat and waited, and the flight attendant stood up in front of us. Now, in the past, people have criticized me. They've said, no, you can't use that accent because you're not of that ethnicity. Don't bite me. Get over it. <laughs> just in case you have that concern, just realize I don't care. <laughs> 
Some of you have been taking notes about my spelling and punctuation. I don't care. <laughs> so young Hispanic gentleman stood up in front of us and he said, All right, attention please. This plane, this plane is designed to land in water. Just one time. <laughs> She went off to get off the plane. And I don't know where he came from, but he, he brushed by me and got up to my wife as she went to get off. And he tapped her on her shoulder and he said, You be careful now. <laughs> you don't bump your head. simple story. First off, they realized that they weren't about trying to get you where you're going. And it's just like just like the salty story. It's they realized that getting you where you're going, getting your luggage there, that's the ante. That just gets you the game. That just builds a relationship. But their goal is in every person, you look at all of those people, every person looked at this as an opportunity to create that. Second thing they did is they realized to shine when it's darkest. Now when things are going well, people can't tell whether you're special or not. You just look like it's just the way it is. It's when things aren't going well that all of a sudden you have a chance. You have a chance to show that you can be different than that. You know, plan for, you know the kinds of things that don't go well. You know the, the, the patterns, because everything works in a pattern. Figure out what those things are and decide this is our chance to shine. You know, so many of the other airlines, when the airport was packed, you could just see they were there and they were in the whine mode. Oh, I ain't there. Like, I ain't my job. I ain't my coworkers. I ain't you. You know, and they, because they have an excuse, don't they? They have, which is true, absolutely. This is not their fault. It's not their responsibility. But it's also not the fault of responsibility for any of those Southwest people. But they have an entirely different world because they chose to create it that way. Next, build trust by extending trust. To me, this example is especially important for those of you that are in leadership positions. When Christian came out, he didn't come out and ask me the same questions that that ticket agent asked me, which so many managers do. You know, managers, I'm the manager, therefore I'm in control of everything, therefore I just ask you the same stupid like my wife, my wife worked for the state of Idaho for 12 years. I wanted to hurt those people. <laughs> Why'd you come to Kansas? Because, you know, because so, they're, they're in every state. I have no doubt, these people. And they would fit right in. You could plug one in and plug one out and do, you know. And we, and I, I would guess except for you. And that's, you got to fight the system. I truly believe. Don't let them force you to be, you would, you know what? The people that, the people that need to be here, are here. And they're at home. And I'm sure, however they are at home, in the same way, or in the same way, it's, it's, you get it. You know, that's the scary part. 
They say if you sow a thought, you reap an action. You sow an action, you reap a habit. You sow a habit, you reap a character. You sow a character, you reap a destiny. It all begins with the thoughts that we sow first. You are taking your time to sow the thoughts. To realize what is important. To feed that most important part of us. To be that human becoming that we all are. We're all a work in progress, aren't we? That we choose to be. But some people don't. Some people have died so long ago they can't even remember when. <laughs> but fortunately, they're still getting paid, I guess. I remember they when, remember when they did one DVD, or actually these were when CD writers first came out. There was somebody at her office that was in charge of that. And you know, it's like not that difficult. You know, now everybody in the world has not only that, they have DVD and a CD and you know, all that. But back then it was brand new, you know, and her bureaucracy, the person that had control was like, mine, this is mine, mine. I have control of this. You know, he probably took the power cord with him when he went home. It's mine. Gives <laughs> <laughs> me security, it's mine. And I will tell you that I, I have eaten the manual. So <laughs> Nobody else will learn his mind. But, uh, we don't share with others. Christian, Christian leaned over the counter and he said, Mr. Morgan, it's your birthday. How do you think he made that gate agent feel? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You trusted me. Isn't that how you want? Well, you know, if he'd asked the same questions, that gate agent would have said, do it yourself then. Do it yourself. If you're going to do those same things. I have been talking about empowerment for so many years, I can't tell you. And yet, statistically, such a small percentage actually feel empowered to do what's necessary. Because we say one thing, and then we do something else. And it's a conflict. And what means more? Is it what we say or what we do? It's what we do, exactly. He did, didn't he? He showed <coughs> he believed in his co-workers. Next, not one deposit, but many. I'll go into this in detail later on. And to me, it is so fascinating. But you know, we have we have 21st century technology. We really have 15th century physiology. Our physiology is not kept up with changes in our world. Our physiology is still designed to notice what might be considered to be a threat. If you have a wonderful day and everything is going well that day, but you have one thing go wrong during that day, what do you often think about on the way home? <laughs> well, one thing, because your physiology is still designed to notice. Those things that might be considered to be a threat. That's why, do, do, do. you know, for example, if you're working with a group of people and everybody's making a smiley face at them, <laughs> but one person is making a face at you like this, who do you always notice? <laughs> like, do, 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 do. Uh oh, look out! Because if you're out in the jungle and something makes a face at you like that, what's about to happen? <laughs> 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 That's, you're wired to notice that. It's also true, no news is what? Good news. No. Not the way we're wired. They've done studies with MBA students when they're testing. If they praise them during testing, their test scores go. If they criticize, test scores go. Yeah. But if they give no feedback at all, test scores go. Yeah. Yeah. Because of the way we are. And again, go back to the jungle analogy. You're out of the jungle, and all of a sudden the jungle gets really quiet. <coughs> uh oh, <laughs> not good. So it's so true. Like you come to an event like this, and let's say you go home and you say, you know, I've learned so much. I got some wonderful ideas, but you're busy because you've been gone, and so that you, you know you just rush in your office. You don't say anything to anybody else, especially if you're a supervisor. Do you think the people that work for you or outside of your office thinking, oh, I bet they've got some wonderful things to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no news is bad news. That's why we have to make an extra special effort, extra special, in order to look for and to create the good news. Because realistically, think about education. Oh, when is the only time in education you're ever going to be in the newspaper? <laughs> Exactly, and you're going to hear about it over and over and over and over in you know, 47 gajillion different ways. I mean, bad news, and this Terry Scheibel thing is, it's been so sad and had me so confused. I mean, there were times when I just absolutely made up my mind, and then something else happened and be like, oh, okay, now I can't make up my mind. And in other words, I'll see something else, or the fact that now they're having separate funerals. I'm like, that's not right. 
And so it's just no easy, there's just, there's nothing easy about this. But did it need to focus our attention? Did it need to be on hours and hours and hours and hours every day? No. No. Part of, why is it that way? Why is it? Because our physiology is designed to notice it. Your physiology is designed to, you know, capture your attention. You know, a few days ago they wanted to show all of the sharks that were off the coast of Florida. There's a gajillion sharks out there. And yet they'll tell you that there's a greater chance of being killed by having a vending machine fall over on you. <laughs> and yet they don't show the vending machines on TV. <laughs> Why? Because it's not about news. They're in the business of, of they're in the business of getting your attention. The most limited resource in the world, it's not oil, the most limited resource in the world is attention span. <laughs> Isn't that true? And they're in the business of getting your attention. What are we going to do to get your attention? What do they do? The easy thing to do is to show you bad news because you're going to pay attention. I, I don't know what the ratings are like, but when they put a program on there, here you are in Nebraska and you're watching shows about sharks. Yeah, oh, that's scary. <laughs> <laughs> Is it true though? This is the thing. Yeah, well, <laughs> you walk out your front door and you're dum 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 dum. Oh, no. What was that noise? <laughs> so you gotta make more deposit. So all the whole purpose for all of that was to help you to recognize that you tend to notice, you tend to remember the bad news. Because of that. And one to one relationship with somebody else. One positive to one negative. Negative relationship. You think, well, it's even. Here's a positive, here's a negative. <coughs> negative. Because the negative weighs more. The negative is noticed more. The negative is remembered more. Two positives to one negative is neutral. It has no emotional power. Right? And they said, well, is emotional power important? You know, people ask me, well, do you do anything that is not, quote unquote, motivational? Why would I? What would be the way if I do something that people are not going to act on? Because the only difference is, for me, is that I want to do something in such a way that it encourages you to take action. Because if you don't take action, I am wasting both of our time. And it takes a lot of positive in order to overcome the negative. Because we tend to remember and to notice the negative. It takes three positives for every one negative. A positive relationship with somebody else. So my question to you is, do you spend three quarters of your time Catching people doing things well. We? I mean, how many of you are appreciated too much for what you do? <laughs> how many of you appreciate others too much for what they do? No, oh, isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? Because the nice part is when you appreciate somebody else, who always gets it back? You do. You always get it back, and yet we don't tend to do that. They say there's two ways to have the tallest building in town. One is to build. The building up. The other is to tear the other buildings down. What do most people do? Tear the other buildings down. But you know what? I truly believe you can't do that without tearing <laughs> your own down. You can't. You've got to be willing to feed all the time to decide to look for the best in everyone <laughs> and in everything. I started reading this on the way here. When I first got it, I thought, oh, I don't know if I want to read this. That's the, it's called Raising the Bar. And it's a story about this Gary, Gary Erickson. Gary Erickson started a company called Cliff Bar. And if you are a distant cyclist, or, and actually there's a great, these become, you know, health food people, they love this Cliff Bar. And he, he developed the company because, you know, he had been on a 175 mile bike ride. Nice. And had taken power bars. Power bars are from Boise. And he had you know, eaten five of them. And he went to eat a six one and says, I cannot eat another one of these things. They taste that bad. And so we developed this company in order to, to grow that. Well, part of the first part of the book is he's 37 years old, and they want to buy his company for $120 million. $120 million. And it started you know, just in 1990, so that was like seven years later or something like that. $120 million they want to buy his company. And he's sick, sick, sick to his stomach. And they said, well, it's because you're, you know, you're going to be rich and wealthy forever. He takes a walk outside, and he looks around and says, I can't do it. I can't sell this company. No way. It just means too much to me. Walks back in, tells his partner. Send all, all the attorneys were there. They were all there signing the papers. Let's go for this. Let's go. He says, send them home. He sends them home. On top of the fact that he is now not ultra wealthy, his partner is very unhappy. 
She is. She wants him to buy her out right now. He has ten thousand dollars in the bank. She wants fifty million dollars, or she's going to fold the company. So he has ten thousand dollars in a bank. So now he doesn't have this money. He doesn't have a partner, and he's fifty million dollars in debt. Which, by the way, nobody will loan him. Nobody will loan him. Are you curious about what happens next? Because <laughs> this is, you can see this is my highlight. This is as far as I've gotten so far. But, but at every turn, at every turn, I'm like, oh no, no, not it, not so. You know, I, I would have said, I quit. That's it. I'm out of here. But he doesn't. He doesn't back down. He doesn't quit. He is just constantly feeding. At a times when, when he first started the company, they had the first year or so, they had two hundred thousand dollars in sales. You know, brand new companies are your, you know, a little bit. Okay. They, they also got sued for one hundred twenty thousand dollars. Now, when I read that, I went, I'm brand new. I started a company out of my mom's kitchen, by the way. Out of my mother's kitchen, I started this company. My first year of doing it, I had one lawsuit that cost me, I can't remember how, $10,000. But another one cost me $120,000. My sales were only $200,000. How many of you would have quit? I thought, dork, stupid, dog. <laughs> yeah, I would have I packed. I would have thought, I don't know enough. So, again, everything in life happens to teach you a lesson. I realize my lesson to me is, don't, don't back down. Don't back down. Look at these people. Look what they have accomplished. Because what it shows me is I have a sensitivity to making mistakes. I do. I'm a control freak. I'm an absolute control freak. But one of the things that I am learning right now at this stage of my life that is, is new in my life right now. Like what I'm doing today, people say, well, have you done that? Some of my stories I've done, but what I'm doing today, I have never done before. Because I'm willing to let go of my need to control everything. And be able to say, oh, I want you to experience what I'm experiencing right now in my life. And one of the things I've experienced is realize, don't worry about it so much. And his metaphor for him, he's a mountain climber. I, you know, to me, he's you know, looking down. If my wife had to stand on this chair, it'd be like way too high. <laughs> right? But in mountain climbing, you belay somebody. And you belay somebody, and so you might have a thousand feet below you. But the idea of a belay is that you, you might let go of that rock, and there's a thousand <coughs> feet below you, but you only drop. You know, a few feet. And so his belief is when he walked away from $120 million, he says, I don't care. If, if I gave up now, I wouldn't know if I could have done it. And they, he was going to sell it because all the big guys, Nestle, were, they were buying his competitors. They said, can you compete? And everybody said, no, you can't compete. You've got to be bought out by somebody else. And that's why he was going to quit. But his point is, I'll never know. I'll never know if I could have done it. And if I fall, I'm only going to fall that belay. And yes, don't we over-believe that our, our failures are going to be something huge and enormous and terrible? Just like this, you know, the young man I told you that said, we're going to sing a song. Everybody else might be thinking, oh, you know, I'm, not, I'm not willing to risk. Are you willing to risk and say, oh, we're going to sing a song? You know, no way. No way, because it's, it's a risk of failure. What if I make a mistake? What if it doesn't go well? Who cares? Who cares? Because you, then you're all the way in the game. You're making the effort regardless. I was afraid... I was scared to see my grandpa, who I saw just a few weeks ago, because he had been, he's 95 years old, 95. I have not dealt well with death in my life. I haven't been good at that. And he'd gone now into an Alzheimer's unit. And so I was like, oh, I don't want to see my grandpa in an Alzheimer's unit. This is going to be hard for me. Yeah, I got there, and uh, his bed now is on the floor, because he you know, climbs out of bed and falls, and they don't want to fall. And so he was there, and my, you know, my grandma, my grandma's doing a little better, and she's in an assisted living, but she was there with him. And I got there, and he was in his bed there, and I thought, you know, this is, this is cool. This is where he needs to be right now. So I climbed in next to him on bed, a big snuggle. I said, this is, we don't need to talk. We don't need to know anything. We don't need to do anything. We don't need to get up. We don't need to be shiny. We just need to be. We just need to be there. My grandma was upset with him, you know, for not. In fact, she made the comment. She said, he left me. No, it's not right. But she's just, you know, it's okay. She's just frustrated. She's just, she's just scared. She's just scared. I was scared. But for me, when I could just let go and just realize, it just is. It just is. This book, Gary Zukoff, I read this on my way out. See the soul. 
It doesn't matter, you know, this is not intended to be about religious beliefs, although this is a very spiritual book. But some of the things it says in here are, to me, very, very healing for me. And, and part of it is, is that, you know, the reason that we're here, the reason we're on earth, is for earth to teach us lessons. And everything that happens, happens to teach you a lesson. And for me, I am, I'm really trying hard to pay attention to the almond on the floor lesson, you know? Uh, all of those, the close the suitcase lesson. Because to me, I, I learn to teach. Because that's what I'm put here for. I know it. You know, this is what I do now. It's not something that I was trained to do. I was never on the debate team. I didn't do any of those things. And I only talk about, you know, what I believe in. Because then if my, if my belief is bigger than me, then I don't care about me. It doesn't matter. It's not about me. It's about what is sort of passing through to share with you. So I believe that everything happens. And you've got to find, look for resources all around you all the time, wherever they are, whether they're in a book. But it's also, I said before, my job, my responsibility to you today is to try to make it memorable. Your job is to try to do something with it. I seriously, I have spent 25 plus years since my time in college. I have read, I have studied everything I could possibly find to try to understand how we shape the perceptions of our world. So hearing the ideas today, my goal only is to encourage you to, and, all, and probably all of you already are already on the path, because again, the people that are not on the path are not and not here. So uh, hopefully for you, I'm just I'm just reaffirming where you already are. I mean, you wouldn't be wearing that little spotty space sticker out there if you weren't crazy already. <laughs> right? We're having fun. If you didn't, you don't. People people that aren't having fun, they don't have a bunny rabbit on their jacket. They don't wear bunny rabbits, do they? No. So you're already there, but don't let the rest of the world convince you it's not the right place to be. Don't let them convince you. And yeah, there's so many people that are just so convinced. That it's just miserable to miserable to miserable. And because they believe that, then in fact for them, it absolutely is. It's what we choose to see. Unique contributions. You look at all those people that impacted me in this story. Were any of them required to do what they did? No. It used to say on the napkins that Southwest had, it used to say the freedom to be yourself is the freedom to be your best. It's so true, isn't it? It's not to be. I watched uh, Ray. Have you seen the movie Ray? Yes. Wasn't that great? Uh, but I didn't realize that in the beginning he was just he just copied everybody else. And when he really did so well, and I realized he broke so many rules, is when he found his voice. And he broke rules. And, you know, remember, he was doing so well. If you haven't seen the movie, you ought to see it. But you know, he's, he's got this popular following, and he decides, hey, I'm going to do country. And people are like, are you nuts? You've got this following. You've got to be crazy. Like, no, so I grew up around country. And then he jazzed up gospel. He says, no, you can't change gospel. He says, no, gospel is who I am. That's what I've heard. You know, and it just, he was powerful. That was cool. So, you need contributions. Figure out what yours are. Don't let anybody, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Don't let anybody try to make you like they are. Be who you are. It's all the difference. Next. Congruent theme. Congruent theme is about make sure everybody's contributing. Everybody is part of that process. In, in education or even in, in public service of all kinds, I think sometimes that seems for people to be very hard. Because part of what happens, sometimes you get people that are on the team that are really not on the team. Right? They're counting down the days, the hours, how many years I got to be here, my life is miserable, and my gift in life is making other people's lives miserable. <laughs> and you notice I'm quite good at it. <laughs> okay? And some people say, well, you know, what in, in a public service environment, what do you do about that? How do you create that kind of environment? Or what do you do to change that? In Cliff Barr, one of the things that he realized as he was rebuilding the company, from where he was. He realized that something out of, I think it was out of good to great, actually. And 
they said in order to get the good people in, first thing you got to do is you got to get the bad people out. out. And you might say, well, yeah, that might be true, but we're in public service, therefore we cannot get the bad people out. You may not be able to get them out of their position, but get them out of your circle of influence. Don't let them impact you. My friend Tyrone Shannon, Tyrone Shannon, he does this when people are dumping on him with all this. And you only have so much energy in your life, you know, and there are certain people who are going to come in and just, <laughs> Tyrone puts his hand up and says, I don't go there. I don't go there. Don't bring this to me. What I have found in the years that I've been doing this is that organizations that choose to be that way, the people that are that way, even though they don't have to leave, they will. Because they feed off of, they need an environment where they can be that way. I worked for the VA Medical Center in Walla Walla, Washington. I thought, oh, you know, that's got to be a place that's just, you know, the rest of bureaucracy. Ugh. But the people there decided, no, we don't allow that. So the people that were that way, they created such a social culture that we, we are about believing in and looking for the best in each other and everything. The Southwest Airlines, their second book called The Southwest Airlines Way, which was done after 9-11, because their first book called Nuts was about what they did before, and the people said, well, yeah, you can do this, but we can. Because you're special. You have a different circumstance. And so the entire book is written about no. And they tried to, to get rid of all of those other you know, excuses. By looking at from 2001, 9-11, till now, what do they do? Big things for them? They hired totally on relational competence. Relational competence. Looking for people that have the ability, the desire, the commitment to make relationships work. They say the easiest way to get fired at Southwest is to offend another employee. Oh, isn't that the coolest? <laughs> and, and when they hire, and during the probationary period, they'll use every conflict they look at a conflict, you know, most of us say, oh, conflict, oh, bad. They look at conflict and say, oh, good, good. Because now's our chance to see how these people work it out. And so they'll immediately, if there's conflict, put people together. Let's see what happens. They look for the dynamics. If they find people that aren't the kind of people that want to make it work out, you're out of here. You're out of here because you're not part of that. So I realize physically you can't do that. You can always do that by doing this. I don't go there. Don't bring that to me. You have got to take responsibility. We take responsibility for what we put in our mouths. Take responsibility for what you put in your... Exactly. Don't let those people rain on your parade. And I, I, I am, this is a lesson I am trying very hard to learn for myself because I'm sensitive. I don't know why, but I'm very sensitive to being talked down to. You know, if somebody talked down to me, it's like, yeah! and I'm, I'm pretty verbal. So if you can... <laughs> Can you imagine that I could use words as a weapon? Yes. <laughs> so my my natural tendency is, if I'm attacked, it's like, ugh, ugh, you're gonna regret this. But they're, it's not about them. It's not about them. And don't take myself there. No way. Don't let those people you know, hook me into their little story. And I'll share one with you in just a little bit. Okay, how I struggle with this all the time. But the better I get the cooler it is. I have never been so happy as I am right now. I have never been healthier than I am right now. I'm almost 50 years old. Kind of like that. But it took a lot of years, and it's just going to get better every day. Just like life is just beginning. <coughs> that is so cool. Congruent theme. Decide for yourself in everything that you do. And try to search for that theme. Don't let other people run on your parade. Does it work? I just want to show you from a business standpoint. Back in 2002, October is a tough time for airlines, still is, but Southwest did still earn $75 million. Oh, yes. Look at that. American Airlines, they lost at the same time $924 million. Delta laid off 8,000 people. Southwest cost per seat miles of one half. One half of the industry standard. Their company is worth $10.8 billion, which is more than all other airlines combined. But people said again, well, you're just different. We can't do that because you don't have unions. Well, actually, 
more union members as a percentage than all the other airlines. But for them, the unions are on the same side. They work together to create the environment they want. Never suffered a layoff or strike even after September 11th. Think about it. Never lost a person. They got 200,000 resumes last year. Out of that, they hired 6,000 people, which as a percentage makes them more selective about their hiring than Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> now think about it. Think about all the people that have been laid off all of the other airlines. Are there a lot of people out there with the technical expertise for those positions? Is that what they were looking for? No. No. Look for that relational competence. Here's a fascinating statistic to me. Southwest has 1,478 mechanics for 366 airplanes. Now to be fair, Southwest only has one kind of airplane. And they do contract out for some major repairs. But just in comparison, United Airlines has roughly half again as many airplanes. How many mechanics do you think they have? They have nine times. <coughs> Nine times as many mechanics, 12,600 Now think about it. what was the last union that would not compromise at all before United went bankrupt? Now there's a lot less than the 12,600 left. Got to be willing to be courageous. The secret of happiness is freedom. The secret of freedom is courage. Got to be courageous enough to do the things that we need to do them. Not let the rest of the world shape you. Not make you afraid. Who are the most fearless people you know? What age group, pardon me, is better? What age group are the most fearless people? Our children are just fearless. Think about what you were like as a child. What were you like? When was the last time you were fearless? That's cool. Oh. Fearless? No, I think one of the things he said, one of the things he did so well, was to tell us, no, he was afraid. He was very afraid. In one of the interviews, after he passed away, he talked about how the fact that, you know what? I won't kid you. He says, there are times when it gets very, very hard. Times when, said for hours, and I'll get pretty low. And then he said, but then I'll find a different way to look at it changed his story. Because you could say, well, yeah, he's upset or unhappy because he, he's paralyzed. You know, he's quadriplegic. And how, how can you not be to go from where he was being a tremendous, you know, a superstar, superman, you know, athlete to being, you know, paralyzed, can't even breathe on your own. Sure that would be. But it wasn't that event that made him so upset. It was the story that he told himself about that experience of not accepting the fact that he's quadriplegic. Because as soon as he accepted it, he says, I am quadriplegic. I am here for a reason. I am here to do something for those that are like me, to set an example. Don't you admire him so much more for him as a quadriplegic than he ever did? That's Superman. Look at wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever life has dealt you, and realize it is there for a reason. You have a responsibility to use that learning to share with others. What works? I share all these things. People say, well, and people will tell me, in fact, I just got a note. I kept in my email for almost a year a note from a man in Florida who said, you know, we don't hire people to do what you do. We need people with specific skills that relate to our product lines. I kept it in my email because he doesn't need because <laughs> I thought there is no more important skill, none. To me, this is a master skill. If I can manage myself effectively, I can manage the way that I see the world, there is no skill more powerful. And this book, Peak Performance, they say the highest, the biggest difference in high performing organizations was emotional energy. When I have been around teams that, that have that emotional energy, it's just unstoppable, isn't it? I mean, that's all the things. You know, that's why we want to watch Hoosiers 4,700 times. Because <laughs> we're like, wow! And they just didn't believe they couldn't do it. Because they could. To me, the easiest path, and what I want to try to do is share paths. How do I get here? 
You say, okay, maybe this is where I want to be. How do I get there? First, just remember, try to remember back what it was like when you were brand new. What was that like? And watch, watch people that are brand new. Watch people. See what those people are like when they're, they're just getting hired, new to the job. You know, and they've gone through the interviews, they check the references, and they, they show up for that very first day of work, and they're, they're like, woo! All right, I'm from Wahoo! <laughs> Right? This is going to be great. And the other people working there look at them like, you know, they may not have told you. <laughs> if, if everything about this job. And we feel it's important to fill you in, tone you down to a reasonable level. <laughs> they're excited because they're looking for what they want in that position. It's not true just in Joss, it's true in all of our relationships. So we leave here right now, we go downtown, we go to a local restaurant. We don't go inside the restaurant, we just press our little faces on the window. <laughs> Could we identify the new couple in the restaurant without even going in? Sure we could. Because they'd be sitting together, oh. <laughs> we don't need food. <laughs> Uh, and yet the couple that's been together for a while, yeah, where's my food? <laughs> yeah, these people are eating the same food in the same restaurant exactly the same time. Whose reality is accurate? They both are. Of the, re of the information that reaches your eyes, only about one millionth will ever get to your brain. It's that millionth that you choose to look for in your environment. The best example of children, aren't they? Little kids, little kids from dawn till dusk, they want to do one thing. They want to have uh, Yeah. It's like 5.30 in the morning, you know, come on now, let's sing a song. <laughs> I love that little commercial with the little kid with the Cheerios. Oh, yeah. oh, we got to get some of this cholesterol up. <laughs> but dad is like, it's very thoughtful. It's very early. <laughs> it's very early. <coughs> little kids, my wife tells me that when she was a little kid, she used to make sure to take her bath before she went to bed and then put her clothes on so that when she woke up in the morning, she could begin to play immediately. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm ready to have to get dressed. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Isn't that true? <laughs> I was telling my wife the other day, I remember, you know, when I was young and my mom would want to take a nap. Those mothers, you want to take a nap really bad. And you know, so the mom knew that she had to watch me, you know, so I'd have to lay on the bed also with her, you know, when she was going to take a nap, and I would have to take a nap too. And I remember, you know, <laughs> you know, and I would always get busted, you know. <laughs> like, we hate it. I mean, the worst time of day for a young child is when they have to go to. Yeah. yeah. Now imagine that for you as adults. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go to bed. <laughs> for us, it's more like my bed, my thing. <laughs> I love my bed. I especially love my pillow. <laughs> My bed in the hotel here, I have six pillows. I hate all six. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you just and you're just so hopeful because when I saw all six, I'm like, oh, there's got to be a good one. There's got to be a good one, you know. And then you get one. Oh, you know, another one. And, and, and then you know, but I didn't give up. I kept trying them. You know, I'd cycle them over because maybe if they warmed up, they'd be better. <laughs> you, know, you just have a certain way of like pillows, you know? <laughs> little kids, little kids are able to focus. I remember I was taking up best friend Brendan, his young son, was on a windsurfer. I was paddling on a windsurfer. He was in front of me. It's hard to imagine, but I wasn't really paying attention. <laughs> and I looked around and he was face down in the water. So I reached out and I grabbed him by the shirt and boom! I said, Nick! Wasn't that fun? <laughs> Dick looked at me like, I don't know. <laughs> but did he cry? <coughs> oh no. 
kids, I mean, you know, when kids cry, it's usually the parents that do it. It's usually the parents do it. Because you know the parents that have, you know, lots of little kids, you know, the kids will fall down and skin the whole, you know, side of their leg off, you know, whatever. Their parents are like, yeah, pick it up, come on, let's go. You know, right? <laughs> so, you know, moms, moms are much better at that. Dads are not good. You know, dads, if you skin the whole side of your leg off, then your dad's got to get the iodine. <laughs> that can't even be legal anymore. <laughs> I'm sure he enjoyed doing it. I'm just, there's some iodine on there. <laughs> and and you, you hope that mom is there because mom will at least blow on it. <laughs> and mom will blow on it. And mom turned blue. She passes out. Blow, mom, blow. <laughs> Great. You know, dad's like, blow, yeah, you blow yourself. Kevin, shut up. You spin yourself anyway. <laughs> I remember little kids are that way. Some people, as they grow up, are just still that way. They never really grew up. I asked my dad not long ago. My dad, my, by the way, my dad now is 70 years old. He had to make business, business cards for him. He says, I'm 70 years old. I can do whatever I want. He <laughs> says on his business card. I told him, Dad, I still feel like a kid. I said, when's that going to change? He said, never. I said, that's cool. My father-in-law is like that. Look at his face. Look at the lines in his face. Can't you tell he's honoring? <laughs> he, just is. he just likes to make you laugh. He's always. He does two things in the morning. He does the crosswords and he reads funny papers. And he gets in the morning. He, just, he comes out of his room with his PJs on. He's got to get the paper out. Lay the paper out. Look at the crossword. Got to get the lay of the land. <laughs> he says, "You know, a guy that don't read the funny, he's just missing out on about half a life." <laughs> That's just the way he sees it. When I meet people like that, I always want to ask. I'm always searching. Okay, you know, what's the common denominator? What's the pattern? And when I find that there is a pattern, the pattern is that the people that have been given the most seem to appreciate it. My father-in-law was given away as a child. His family couldn't afford him. Depression. He had to live in a barn. He still can't eat mutt. That's all he got to eat. But fortunate because he gave that gift, that way of seeing the world, to my wife. Because she makes people feel better when they're with her than with anybody else. And I know she got that gift from him. Because she definitely didn't get it from her mom. <laughs> <laughs> Idiot. <laughs> so my brother lost pace. He's stressed out. He's 
pacing back and forth. You get all the rest of us all stressed out. You ever been around people like that? Mm -hmm. Stress. That's why I think, you know, this is not good. It's not good. Getting everybody all stressed out? That's bad because what do most people die from? Stress. Yeah. In first aid, they say that shock is what kills most people. So one of the things they teach you is if you ever come upon a bad accident, you're never supposed to go, because <gasps> then they die. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? Yeah, I did. Sorry. <laughs> Can I help you? So they, they always teach you. Oh, we'll sew that right back on. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that part of you? I'll put that on too. <laughs> Any place you want. You just make a little drawer. So I think, yo, this is just not healthy for us. Everybody's getting all stressed out. So I went in the bathroom there, the hospital. I looked over and I found a little <laughs> urine sample. <laughs> so then I filled it up with really hot water. <laughs> Sorry, we don't have any money for you today, but you know, but, but how about one of these? <laughs> Can't you see that poor guy? Oh, golly, well, I'll leave that. I'll You want to get in the truck? I'm getting in the truck. <laughs> She actually did it, but it really wouldn't matter how many times she actually did it, would it? Because every time she would open that drawer, she would see it, she would see it, and you would imagine that. 
That's what's so, it's what's so powerful about every one of these ideas, is it doesn't, it doesn't have to happen over and over again. Now, I'll, I'll be with my family at Christmas time with my younger brothers. We will tell the same silly stories over and over and over again. But it'll be just as if they'd happen. It just, it's just a matter of how we choose to create that. The next day, we saw my mother-in-law in the hospital, and you know what you look like when you're in the hospital. Uh, you look like something that puppies spit out. <laughs> you get more visitors than Grand Central Station just about that time. And so we walk in, and my wife looks at her mom. She said, Mom, who did your hair? <laughs> That's where she does one of these. Oh, no one. <laughs> I, I am dying. I am like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, you're trying a lot to, you know, that's not appropriate. <laughs> they go out in the hallway. It's one of those where you laugh so hard you stop yourself. Oh, I see. <laughs> Shores, Washington with my mom and dad. And we stopped at a hospital in Olympia where my Uncle Bert was there. And my Uncle Bert was dying. And even though he had a will that talked about the financial arrangements, he didn't talk about how he wanted to die. And he was suffocating his own fluids. My mom's crying. My dad's crying. This is not fun. I mean, got on the elevator and there was a man standing behind us on the elevator. Have you ever seen a man when they're holding the wife's purse? Yeah. <laughs> this is particularly good one, this one right here. Yeah. Especially if it was a purse like this. <laughs> get that stupid purse anyway, right? We would never hold it by the handle, would we? We would always sort of wad it up. <laughs> Sometimes there are bosses that way, where you're, you're having fun, and you know, they're like, you're having fun? You need something to do, I'll find you something to do. Like, oh, fun. What time is it? No. Right, they just, and yet, yet we do everything. Don't we? We do everything we do better if we enjoy doing it. But to me, it's creating the physiology. At first, I've got to find that physiology. Just like, for me, part of my goal is to create that physiology for you today. Because once I can create the physiology, then the, your mind begins to work. It's like, we are, our minds are state-specific. 
That's how we store and retrieve information. That's our filing system. And the filing system works like this. If you're depressed, then you open the depressed filing cabinet drawer, don't you? And because you get depressed, and then how many other things do you become depressed about? Depressed, depressed, you know, everything, uh, oh, depressed. And then, you know, or you wake up in the middle of the night and you all of a sudden you're anxious about something. Then how many other things do you get anxious about? You tell yourself, don't think about that, and you go from anxious this to anxious about that to anxious about something else to, you know, at the end you're just anxious, I, I might not have underwear for the morning. I don't, I don't you know, what else? What else could go wrong? Right? But it's also true is that when we begin to laugh and have fun, then all of a sudden you have access to that drawer, that filing cabinet drawer of those thoughts or those possibilities. They're all there, it's just we gotta choose to open that drawer for us. And to me, it's about a physiology. It's creating a physiology that provides that for us. And once I get my physiology right, then the rest of me works well. But I gotta get my physiology right first. To me, it's creating an environment where we can do that. And I, I shared that, for example, with the, the Montana Funeral Directors Association. <laughs> think about how hard would that be? How hard would it be? just think it's so to be there, to be open to other people and their experiences. And, and yet have enough reserve yourself. And uh, so at break, young gentleman came to me, 26 years old. Big, young, strapping Montana boy. He said, you know, it is so true. He said, I was diagnosed with leukemia six months ago. I was like, oh, I am so sorry. He said, oh, there's, there's not a sign of it anywhere in my body right now. He says, but keeping a sense of humor made all the difference. He said, when I was in the hospital, he says he was at a stage where the chemotherapy was beginning to lose his hair. And so his sister's there and his mom is there and he's experiencing it for the very first time and he's sort of like, whoa, that is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> and so he tells his sister, he says, sister, you gotta try this, this is really cool. It's, she's like, ah, no, I don't think so. It's just, just what this is cool. Come on, try it. She says, oh, okay, all right. So she reaches up, grabs the top of his hair, gives it a pull. Whoa, that <laughs> is so cool. <laughs> so he tells his mom, Mom, you got to try this. You, this is really cool. And his mom, of course, is like, that's my baby boy. <laughs> well, I'm not going to do that. I still have the top of hair for money, but some baby. <laughs> Oh, and he's like, Mom, really? You gotta do this. Come on. Let's go. Come on. No. Yeah, come on. Come on. All right. So she reaches up, grabs about you know, three hairs in the top of his head, gives a little pull. It's like, Ouch! Quit it! <laughs> left it on, so he takes the cuff off and puts it on the counter, and of course it pumps up every 15 minutes. So, <laughs> right? so here it is, and here he and his sister are there, you know, 15 minutes later, it's, whoa, 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 It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Looks at his sister and says, don't say a word. Whoa, 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 whoa. All of a sudden, the nurse comes charging through the door and laying on the bed. Uh, <laughs> 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 it makes so much difference, doesn't it? <laughs> and kids are so good at it. Just for us to remember that it's possible. Because if we don't, <laughs> because we progress through life, we evolve through life, and if we go down one path, we become more, and don't you know people like this, you know, they go down one path, and we become more and more joyful. The other people go down the other path, and they become more and more miserable. Because we begin to see life that way, and so we look for it to be that way, and then because we look for it to be that way, then we 
it's you know, it's, it's just a vicious cycle. Once we get into it, we have to choose to get out of that cycle. It's one of my favorite magic books. This is from one of the original Winnie the Pooh books. I have all three books I got when I was seven years old. And it says, here he is, Edward Bear, coming downstairs now. Bump, bump, bump on the back of his head behind Christopher Robin. It is, as far as he knows, the only way of coming downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes he thinks there really is another way. If only he could stop bumping for a moment and think of it. I think the greatest value of events like this is an opportunity to stop bumping for a moment have a chance to get far <laughs> enough away that we can look back and say, oh, okay, now there is another possibility if we would choose to find that. Part of the challenge for all of us is appreciating our, our diversity. They have diversity training. This is not one of those. <laughs> How many of you have children? How many of you have more than one? How many of you wonder where one of them came from? <laughs> Table in the back. She's offering a prize if you can figure out where her child is. <laughs> you, know, is it, you, know, you, you have one and you've got it. Yes, I have the perfect parent. I have this absolutely figured out. And then you have another one and you think, what happened? <laughs> well, what did I forget? Because they're so different, aren't they? The one on your right hand side is Mikey. And Mikey's a pleaser. Any of you have pleasers? Just she's a pleaser. This is Halloween, and she's got her cutest little princess costume on, doesn't she? But she got a spa. <laughs> princess. <laughs> How can I make people happy with a spa on my princess costume? <laughs> and Libby, look how angelic Libby looks. Mm. She just looks like a little angel. <laughs> Lily walks into the kitchen with a cracker in either hand and she looks around. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a dryer? <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Libby, we have a dryer of mine. She says, good. Because I just peed all over these tights right here. <laughs> Snacks. <laughs> I'm going to continue to have snacks. <laughs> what is your problem? <laughs> right? Yeah, I don't know what's wrong with you. Yeah. <laughs> Dry out. <laughs> I think I just walk fast. <laughs> they have a they have a green bench in their house. Any of you have like timeout benches or chairs? You know where to go if you're in trouble. They have a green bench, that's the time hop bench. So Michelle, mom, Michelle said, Libby, go sit on the bench. They would say, good, that's where I wanted to go anyway. How did it come out of that little kid? I mean, just think about it. The year after this, so that was October, of course, and then, so the year after that, she began kindergarten. True story. The very first day, the very first day of kindergarten, she walks up to the kindergarten teacher, she says, uh, do you have a cell phone? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and probably doing this with her hands. She's <laughs> <laughs> telling you all they are in their head. Yes, Libby, you have a cell phone? Why? She says, good. I'm calling my mom. This just isn't working for me. <laughs> That has to be the most interesting entrance I have ever made. But you know, you kind of wonder, well, what is this? What is this little bike about? But you know, I, I know that you've been hearing it in the news. In fact, they're 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 supposed to make an announcement today. But uh, 
Apparently, our, our automakers are, are having a little bit of a problem here in the States. And in fact, they may be that they've just had a little gap in reality for maybe a long period of time. And, but they're supposed to make an announcement. You know, the you know, they have a little change process going on, too. You know, they came in on their own private jets, and, and they didn't have a plan, and they weren't working together. So, you know, the lawmakers got together and said, you know, we've got to have a solution. You've got to come up with a solution. They said, well, I'm going to force you. You can work together. Then we're going to help provide you. And so their plan was, if you can come up. It was in Fort Worth, Texas, and oh, I was so excited, you know, because I was born in Texas, and I like that, I like that Cajun food, yeah, give me that Tex-Mex Cajun food, and we got there, and it was a beautiful hotel, you know, one of those nice hotels, they got the phones all the way around the room, and they got the phone in the bathroom, I mean, I don't know about any of you been brave enough to use that phone in the bathroom, I mean, what if you made a noise you weren't supposed to make? Seriously, and if it rang when you weren't expecting it, that'd be, that'd be messy. I just don't think that's good. So we went out. We said, okay, where's the Cajun Tex-Mex food? They said, well, you got to go to Razoo's. All right, okay, we go there and oh. And of course, not being from the area, we ordered the one thing on the menu that none of the locals would eat. And we ordered rat tails. Ooh. Rat tails are deep fried jalapenos stuffed with seafood. And they had the best dipping sauce I ever heard. They must have patented this name for a dipping sauce. It's called Twist Your Butt Hot Dipping Sauce. <laughs> That's sort of visual, isn't it? Just picture that. And so being with a bunch of your friends you haven't been with for a while, then you get sort of rambunctious and you get the macho egos going, Oh, that's not hot. Let me dip that in there. Give me some more of those. Put that in there. Arr. Well, I, I thought they meant it'd be hot when it went in. <laughs> Then you find out why they've got those phones in the bathroom. <laughs> it's like, call 911, help! <laughs> and I was, I was sort of disturbed because here I was going through all this discomfort and my wife was just fine. I didn't really feel good until about halfway through the day when I heard her in there. <laughs> you know, when you go through that little discomfort, you want somebody else to enjoy it too, don't you? Yeah, absolutely you do. But it's fun to be here, you know, the, I, I like the core horse idea. I think that's cool. I'm feeling, I'm feeling, coming here to Montana, hey, it's fun, isn't it? I know I was a little uncomfortable in front of you. I saw some people showed up at the airport. They're a little uncomfortable just being here in Montana. <laughs> yeah, they look around and see all that camouflage orange. <laughs> you could just smell the testosterone in the air. <laughs> and that was the women. I drove from Missoula to Deer Lodge recently and I, I got there and I said, you know, I really want to fit in. So I got there a car rental counter and I said, you know what, I, I want a Montana kind of car. And I showed her my reservation. She said, you get a Ford Contour. Oh, no, that's not going to work. I said, but wait, wait, my travel agent gives me these up, little upgrades, coupons, huh? What do you think? Look at that. Huh? There you go. She said, oh, I don't even want to tell you. I, it's just, you're going to be so excited. I just want you to go out there and look. Stall 33. And there it was, stall 33, Ford Contour, <laughs> with a gun rack in it. All right, now I'm feeling good. People are people almost in spite of people, aren't they? I mean, every, every business, we all have challenges. For me, the greatest challenge is that I have to, like many of you, we have to travel for a living. And it used to be that air travel was no fun. Now, how is it? It's miserable, isn't it? It's just terrible. But you know, it's good for the, the airline industry, I found out. Actually, there's more job security now in the airline industry than ever before. Because what used to be a personality flaw it is now a security measure. Do you know what's that? They can be as nasty as they want to you, can't they? They can just get away with it. That's the way it works. And actually, though, customer service ratings are higher now than they've ever been before. And they've done it in an unusual way. They've lowered your expectations. <laughs> If you don't expect to get, you know, anywhere easily, and when you do, it's like, bonus! Ha! That was easy! Kind of like that. For me, I actually have a renewed appreciation because I, I had a, a program on a military base recently. And I, I tell you what, boy, when they put on those latex gloves, it, they're serious. <laughs> you, you'd be surprised where they think you could hide a weapon. In fact, the, the inspection was so thorough, when I got done, I tried to give them my blue cross card to see if it was covered. <laughs> and when you buy all those one-way tickets, what always happens? 
you get to meet some new friends. Yes, you do. Sort of personal-like. In fact, all of my friends, the prize that I got at the end of the day was I got one of these mighty fine gloves. But it actually works pretty well for me now because now if I get picked for the random search, I just put my glove on first. <laughs> you first. <laughs> I think you guys could really have fun with it because judged on some of your acts, the kind of things that you carry in your, su your suitcases, I don't, I don't know how you'd explain some of those things. <laughs> so I think there's fun things you can bring with you. I think each of you, when you're traveling, just to make it a little fun, you've got to make sure to bring yourself a, a little rubber snake. You know, it's always fun to have that in there when you're searching through all and touching all your stuff. That's always nice. <laughs> Just put it in there between stuff, you know, where they gotta touch it. <laughs> and then you know when they're about to get to it, so you wanna give them a little whoop. <laughs> it, it really, it just adds a little enjoyment. It's just some way to make it a little more entertaining. And, and then it's always good to have a little urine sample cup. <laughs> just to see what they're gonna say about that. <laughs> Remember Art Linkletter? Remember, wasn't he, he's just like the epitome of the nicest man you can ever think of, isn't he? Just like, nice guy. And I didn't know that over the past number of years that he's been working with nursing homes. And one of the things he goes in, tries to cheer up the people in the nursing home, and he likes to give them his picture. And the story he told on Fox News, he gave his picture to this lady, and he says, do you know who I am? She said, no, hon, but if you'll go to the desk, they'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Can't you relate? I mean, I so, I so can. So I, I finish my presentation, I go to the airport, and I'm all hyper, and I'm sitting down, and I'm writing my next presentation, and I think, oh, I better check in. And I looked around. Oh, no, no jacket. Oh, not good, not good, not good. Because guess what's inside my jacket? I go ticketless, because I'm an idiot, and I forget my tickets, but my wallet is inside my jacket. Do you know how hard it is to get on an airplane without your wallet? This is like, not good. So I'm desperate, because I'm like you. I have to go from place to place. I have to get there in order. I cannot miss an airplane. So I'm searching my luggage, and I'm trying to find, OK, what can I do? I've got I to gotta get there. And I look in, I think, oh, good. Wait, wait a minute. I got my business card. And my business card, it's got my picture on it. So I show up at the counter, and I show the lady. I said, hey, what do you think? And she just didn't say no. She says no, and she flicks it at me. I'm like, ah, oh, no, wait, 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 no, wait, no, wait, no, this is good, really. So I, I said, wait, wait. So I look in my bag and I said, okay, I gotta have something else. I said, wait, I got my, I got my brochure. It's got my picture on it. What do you think? Ah, uh, no, wait, 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 wait. I got my, no, it's got my picture on it. No. Now think about this. Wouldn't it have been a whole lot easier to make some fake ID, wouldn't it? So I said, get the manager, bring him out. And immediately you could, you could tell why he was the manager. As soon as they stop performing, they promote them. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. People are going, oh, he's not coming back again, I tell you that, that's it. Ah, he's not coming back here anymore after that. So I have everything laid out on the counter, and and I'm showing him, I say, what do you think, huh? What do you think? He says, do you happen to have any other form of ID? <laughs> Shoot, why didn't I think of that? You know what, you're the boss. I said, I got my name printed in the back of my underwear. Is that gonna work for you? No. I said, well, time out. Wait a minute. I cannot be the only idiot that loses his driver's license. I said, what do you do? He said, well, you gotta get a police report. I said, okay, I'm ready, because I'm got. i going to get it. I'll run, I'll get that, I'll get back here. I'm just, he says, well, you don't have to go anywhere. They'll come here. You call them on that phone. I said, well, let me make sure I understand this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to call them on the phone. They're going to come here. I'm going to tell them exactly what I told you. They're going to write it down on a piece of paper, and by then my airplane is going to be gone. Then they're going to give you this piece of paper, and then it's going to be okay with you. Does that make sense to you somehow? He said, well, it's the P word. P stands for? 
Exactly. That's when I realized why they have metal detectors at the airport. <laughs> it's to protect the gate agents, isn't it? <laughs> but then he said, well, do you happen to have your birth certificate? <laughs> <laughs> sure I do. But my wife is in the office and she faxes my birth certificate just in time for me to get on that plane. But now think about what a birth certificate looks like. <laughs> Couldn't that birth certificate belong to at least half of us in this room? I mean, what are they gonna do? Look at those little feet, Mark, see, those are his little feet for sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanna contrast that. And today, part of what I wanna do is I wanna share in stories because I truly believe that our most limited resource is attention span. And the greatest challenge for us is to first get their attention. Number two is get them to remember. And unfortunately, people don't remember very much. They say you forget about 40% of what you hear with a half an hour, 50% in a day, 70% in five days, and 90% in a week. You know, everything that we share and communicate with other people, how do we get them to retain that? Max Dupree wrote a book called Leadership is an Art, and he calls it tribal storytelling. Stories create a lattice by which we tend to remember things. And challenge for us, how do we help people to remember? Well, the next day I have to leave again. And I'm back in Boise now and I'm leaving and now I have two problems. One, I still don't have my driver's license. And number two is I don't have the companion pass for my wife to fly with me. We fly enough, she can fly for free. And I got there to the airport and they were having one of those days like all of you have had. Apparently all of the airspace for all of the Western United States is controlled out of LA and the computers in LA had broken down and so every single flight was four hours late. As you looked at the boards when you entered the airport, every single board was delayed, 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 delayed. The airport is packed full of people and are these people in a good mood? No, no cranky people everywhere. So think about it, we've all had days like that, haven't we? And I don't know what, how it is for you, but it seems to me that when I'm having a really bad day, I become a magnet for other bad things, don't you? It's like, why the day? I got problems up to here. And so I was going to come to them with another problem. But fortunately that day, I happened to be flying my favorite airline. And based on my personality thus far, what would you guess that airline is? Southwest rocks. Yeah, they do, because in every situation, especially when it's a challenge, these people always make it easy. I was in Phoenix and we wanted to buy those, you know those big steel stars you can get that you can put on the outside of your house. Oh, you gotta have like four of those. Yes, better do that. And so I gave it to the lady after we bought it and I said, could you package this as luggage? And she nodded her head, which should have made me nervous. Because <laughs> she nodded her head because she didn't really speak the language. <laughs> <laughs> and so we got back just in time to go to our flight and she handed us the four big steel stars in a plastic bag. Oh, not good, not good, not good. This could be a weapon. I can't package it. So I show up at the airport, big steel stars, plastic bag, show it to the guy at the southwest counter. He doesn't look at me like, let me guess, Idaho? <laughs> he just whips out his pocket knife, cuts open a box and puts it in like, we do this every day. I mean, they just make it easy. So I got up to the Southwest counter, and a young man was standing there. And I, I said, oh, thank God I'm flying Southwest today because otherwise I'd be screwed. <laughs> he looked at me and said, well, that's pretty good sucking up, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and he went in the back and he got Christian. And I made sure I wanted to look at his name tag because I wanted to see because usually they come out and they stand behind the counter and they put their hands on their hips and they tell you the rules and the regulations and the requirements. And they stand just far enough away you can't quite reach them. <laughs> That's why they have those big counters, think about it. The Christian came out and the first thing he did is he reached over the counter to me. He said, Mr. Morgan, it's your birthday today, isn't it? I said, yes, it is. <laughs> now think about it, these two groups of people, they have the same rules the same regulations, the same requirements. But one person was doing everything they could to make you happy. And the other person was doing everything he could to be right. 
Now, that first person, I'll guarantee it wasn't his fault. I'll bet that he had one of those bosses that said, you will do it exactly the way I told you to do it. You will do it no other way. And thinking will be punished. <laughs> right? We have some supervisors like that, don't we? think we have all of the answers, and people have to come to us for the answer, because that gives us a feeling of power and seniority. Yes, it is. And if you're like that, you're, you're worthless, probably. But so there's another one. He's off the agenda again. I can see that now. So we went out, and we're waiting for our plane. And, and I listened about three gates down. Young man was there making an announcement to the group of people waiting for the plane. He said, all right, how many of you are flying with me today? Raise your hands. And about three people raised their hand. Oh, do I have to? I don't want to raise my hand because I'm in a bad mood, right? And I'd be happy to tell you why I'm in a bad mood. In fact, even if you don't ask, I'll probably tell you. In fact, I'll probably be telling people for the next week. Because that's the way adults are, aren't they? Think about it. You're all like, oh, I've never liked that. Oh, sure. Right? Adults are. They like to hang on. We get upset about things. We like to hang on. We like to rehearse it in our minds and figure out why we're upset. Which is sad because if you had a group full of children and they said, raise your hands, what would happen? Woohoo! Wouldn't they cheeks off the seats, hands in the air, be like, all right, yeah. Because kids realize that the past is just a memory. The future is a possibility. And all they have is what? They got it right now, this very moment. So think about for him. You know, there's a lot of evidence to indicate that he should just give up at this point, shouldn't he? But he doesn't give in. He says, good, because we're going to sing a song. <laughs> Don't you admire the audacity, don't you? He said, all of you know the song. The song goes like this. Dale. <laughs> he said, but we changed the rest of the song. The rest of the song goes like this. When the airplane come, I want to go home. <laughs> uh, now he, he, he didn't get very many people to sing. <laughs> But don't you admire the fact that he tried? That he said, if I'm going to help anybody else, the first person I have to help is who? I've got to help myself. I've got to find a way to have access to that for me. And you look at all the evidence around him. You've got all the people, all the other gate agents, all the passengers, everybody around him looking at him like, look, this is not fun. It's not supposed to be fun. If you are having fun, you're probably on some sort of medication. <laughs> but he doesn't give in. He keeps trying. He keeps trying, doesn't he? Just like for each of us, we got to find a way not to let the world convince us that this isn't supposed to be enjoyable. They say we work something like 83,000 hours in our lifetime. And if you look at most people, they spend most of that 83,000 hours relatively close to miserable. And why is it that way? Why don't we enjoy the process more? Well, we got on the plane finally that day. And the young flight attendant stood up in front of us. And the plane is packed. And we've been waiting for four hours, and we're stuck together, and we probably don't smell very good. And the young flight attendant stood up in front of us. Now, in the past, somebody criticized me for trying to do this in character. Now, if it bothers you that this is in character, then just bite me. Just get over it, okay? <laughs> <coughs> Some people whine about anything, you know? Because I'm doing it in praise of this individual. So as a young Hispanic flight attendant stood up in front of us, he said, All right, attention, please. This plane. This plane is designed to land on water just one time. <laughs> and they said, if we, if we do, you men, you men with the hairy chest, what you do, you take that seat like that with that Velcro. <laughs> he said, you stick it right to your chest. And you paddle right to shore. And you can keep that as a souvenir. I could not hear any of the other announcements from that point on because we're, he turned an entire plane around in just a matter of seconds. He got done with the announcements, which is about the last time I could you know, actually hear him. And he said, all right, pay attention now, because ever it is, we're going to have the announcement in English, okay? 